Good morning, everyone. Um, our invocation will be given today by Nicole Azar of Chalky's Cat Rescue. After years of working to reduce the homeless cat population, Nicole founded Chalky's Cat Crusade, whose mission is to humanely reduce the population of homeless cats in the city of Tampa through targeted trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return. This trap and return policy is more humane and provides a public health benefit to the community. If the cats are social or have kittens, Nicole utilizes local rescues to find foster homes. By empowering people to care for community cats and educating them about trap, neuter, vaccinate, and return, Chalky's Cat Crusade is helping to reduce the number of homeless cats and ultimately the number of cats being killed in animal shelters. Thank you for joining us Thank today. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Could you please stand for the invocation? I just have a brief reading here by Matthew Scully uh, regarding kindness to animals and charity to all living things. It is true, as we are often reminded, that kindness to animals is among the humbler duties of human charity, though for just that reason among the more easily neglected. And it is true that there will always be enough injustice and human suffering in the world to make the wrongs done to animals seem small and secondary. The answer is that justice is not a finite commodity, nor are kindness and love. Where we find wrongs done to animals, it is no excuse to say that more important wrongs are done to human beings. And let us concentrate on those. A wrong is a wrong, and often the little ones, when they are shrugged off as nothing, spread and do the gravest harm to ourselves and others. Thank you. I kept it short for you. <laughs> Right. Thank you so much. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Miranda? Here. Goods? Here. Maniscalco? Here. Fiera? Carlson? Here. Citro? Here. Hertak? Here. We have a physical quorum. To review the rules pertaining to public comment and partition in the um, CRA meeting, I'm going to turn it over to um, Morris Massey. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the August 18, 2022 meeting of the City of Tampa Community Redevelopment Agency, or the CRA, held in City Council Chambers in the third floor of Old City Hall. 315 East Kennedy Boulevard here in Tampa, Florida. The public is able to attend this meeting in person and also view it by cable television on Spectrum Channel 640 or Frontier Channel 15. We also believe we have internet co connectivity, uh, I think, uh, at last. Uh, so you can also view it via the internet at tampa.gov uh, livestream. The public is also able to participate in this meeting during public comment for a maximum of three minutes per speaker, either here in person in the city council chambers or virtually by way of communications immediate technology, which I believe we have access to now. Um, however, the use of CMT does require pre-registration with the city clerk's office, and I'm aware that I don't believe anyone has pre-registered this morning to speak via CMT. Uh, directions for pre-registration are included in the notice of the meeting and on the agenda. Can I please have a motion waiving the CRA standard Sorry. rules to allow public comment uh, via uh, CMT? Thank you. Okay, motion made by Councilmember Goods and seconded by Councilmember Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, so we are going to move on um, to Ms. Travis, uh, our interim CRA director. Are there any um, to talk about any changes to the agenda this morning? Good morning, CRA board. Almost said council. Um, yes, ma'am. I'm. There's a request for us to. Continue items one and two, please, to the September meeting, please. Move to continue items one and two to September's uh, CRA meeting. Motion made by Councilmember Maniscalco, seconded by Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you. And if we could move the, um, the budget conversation I'm looking at. Six. We can move the budget presentation um, before number three, please. So moved. Second. Okay. Motion made by Councilmember Maniscalco, seconded by Councilmember Miranda. All in favor? Aye. 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 
Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we uh, motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Okay. Okay. Uh, motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilmember Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. Uh, now we are in up our public comments uh, section. The public is welcome to comment and on any item uh, for up to three minutes. If you have if anyone would like to comment today, if you could stand up and form a line to your right, my left. Good morning, Connie Burton. Three things I would like to uh, discuss real quickly. Uh, one, uh, it just came across the news channel the other day that the aquarium was receiving $40 million for upgrade. And although you might not deal with that budget, it was very glaring that water sea creatures is going to be afforded, uh, you know, very comfort down there. Tourists coming through, the aquarium is going to be beautiful, and a small amount of money that's being set aside for this housing budget. I know we are talking about. Uh, Federal monies being aligned with that, but I've been in this city long enough to know that when federal monies do come to town, it don't usually uh, hit the targeted intended purpose. By that I mean I've seen where theaters were built uh, with community block grant money, uh, park um, parking stations were built in the past, and so we need to have money that is restricted for housing. I would hope that you all would come back to the city, to the mayor, and make a more demand for an increase for housing that will be way above $5 million. Secondly, you're talking about the apprentice program. I'm looking down at the Hannah Station. I'm down there all the time. I'm trying to see where do people that look like me, where are they working at? They're not down there. I want to see the numbers coming back from we didn't discuss that Hannah project but how in the midst of <clears throat> being in the middle of our community, black folks are not being able to get jobs down there. Tell us the numbers of outside of the small monetary uh, little set aside that has been made for one or two entrepreneurs to get a few contracts. The masses of the people are non-black. And thirdly, uh, I support uh, the women's right to choose about their body. I love the mayor's position and your leadership around that, uh, councilwoman. But something is emerging in this city that uh, has nothing to do with your hands, but it's going to have direct impact on black people living in this city. And that is the emergence of the biking while black. We don't care about what the governor is saying. This is your city. And we will hope that the mayor will move in fast speed directions to alert the police department, do not infringe on the black community to satisfy the thirst of the governor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're, come on, you're next. <coughs> I mean, it is not Tampa, Florida. It's interesting that how relationships get normalized and people see it as just being normal. And when people, if you're having a sexual relationship with your mother or with your child, some people look at it from the outside and they say, oh my gosh, that's nasty. It's something perverted about that. If a man and a man is having a sexual relationship, some people look at it and they say, oh, that's nasty. That's not in the Bible. That's something's wrong about that. They say, oh, that's pedophilia. That's incest. That's, that's bestiality if you decide to have a sexual relationship with an animal. They say it's something wrong with that. But to the people that's doing it, it's a normalized relationship. And if you're having a sexual relationship with a five-year-old or a 10-year-old, after a while it's going to stop hurting and it's going to be a normal relationship. And that's the kind of relationship this city have with poor and working class people. That's the, the kind of relationship that capitalism have with poor and working class people. They normalize it. They normalize doing poor and working class people dirty. They normalize doing African people dirty. 
And after a while, people just look around like the lady was here giving the invocation this morning. She's talking about making a comparison, making a comparative relationship between how you treat animals and say, hey, like, really, that's just as bad as the way people say, OK, well, the way you treat humans, then so forth. But no, you shouldn't let that escape you, how animals are being treated. Well, you definitely shouldn't let the way African people in this city, poor and working class people in this city, and even the middle class people who don't know in this city get treated. $5 million of a $1 billion budget to deal with the issues and the problems of housing and homelessness and people's existence and families, $5 million, and it's just stated, $40 million for the aquarium. But they have normalized the way they treat poor and working class people so it just seems like, hey, that's normal. They can do that. The city council is nasty. Not only the people in city council, the city council itself is nasty. And if you come in here, if you walk up that step, it's a sticker on the step, on the stairwell there that's been there for months. They don't clean the filthy building. They don't clean this nasty carpet. It's nasty. And the city council members are nasty. And they're nasty the way they treat poor and working class people. They're nasty in what they did. You see all the nasty people lined up behind the governor to say they're going to fire someone, remove a person from their job who they say, hey, I have some solidarity with all the wrong things that's been going on historically for hundreds of years. And what they did, inserted someone in that position to start treating black people nasty again to normalize those relationships. But those relationships, and none of them I speak of, incest and the other relationships Pedophilia, they're all wrong. And the way African people get treated in this city is 100% wrong. And we need better treatment. We need it to come from the city council. Thank, Thank you. you. Can, uh, can you just state your name for the record, please? Mentez not. Thank you. Means anything possible in Amarag. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning, Madam Chair, CRE board members, Allison Hewitt, uh, East Tampa resident, business owner, and chairman of the CR East Tampa CRA Sub Economic Development Subcommittee. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so we have a very full agenda, and I'm very excited about the items that are on there. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Chair Hertog and Kelly for taking the tour of East Tampa with myself and uh, Chair Tate. Um, we do have challenges in East Tampa, but we are so excited about the opportunities that we have that are coming up with the help and the support of the CRA. Um, agenda item number one, um, well, the uh, CRA bud budget draft planning. I just want to state that this year's process was very inclusive and included <coughs> a very insightful debate with the CAC members and the community. Um, we'd like to, on agenda two, request your support to update the East Tampa uh, CRP, the 2004. We really need that to be able to move forward. Um, for agenda number number three, um, even though Sire did not have the list of the uh, available lands in East Tampa, one of the reasons why the East Tampa CRA Economic Development Subcommittee recommended in their budget a developer consultant is to not have development happen to us, but to have the community work to develop with the developer consultant on um, development plans or development recommendations for those processes. So um, that developer consultant would be working at the behest of the CRA, the community, working at the feasibility and the um, actual marketability for um, those projects. Um, we'd like to also request your support for the pre-development program. So excited it's here today. I um, want to say um, thank you to Councilman Gould. He um, recommended that, uh, well, he requested that we come up with options to help mitigate gentrification in East Tampa. This is one of the ideas, and thank you to staff for all of your hard work to get us here. Um, I have before you, uh, the Center for Economic Development has been working very hard with landowners. You'll see those landowners, they have over 90 years of owning of that property. Um, to have be eligible for this um, program. So I'm asking for this process to allow the staff to have flexibility because as you know, development is not easy. Sometimes to get to a process, you need the flexibility. So I'm asking that the staff has flexibility with this program to be able to provide assistance to the property owners who will come forward to apply for this program. The last thing is the 
East Tampa SAP. I think all of you might have uh, received an email for me from me about this. I'm disappointed that uh, we had the uh, potential to have a fantastic SAP if they had followed the contract. Um, we have a, a good plan, um, but it's not what the contract asked for, which would have given us one year and five year goals and plans with uh, so much community participation. If we have a roadmap that they can have conversations, it would have been a lot more helpful. So um, thank you very much for your support. I'm glad I got through it all and I'll be available for questions. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair. Oh, yes, I believe. Uh, Ms. Hewitt, uh, you're gonna stick around later because I, I, I see the pre deployment packet. I know staff is gonna make a presentation, but I know you will go to the callus of, of writing it. So I'm gonna to wanna to have some questions for you during their presentation time. I'll be here the entire meeting today. Thank you. Good morning, Keelan McCaskill, East Tampa resident. Um, I really don't have to say much. He touched the uh, pre-development, but um, thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. I'm excited about the pre-development program, but I'm very disappointed that that subpar SAP is back again for discussion. I'm more, uh, more so disappointed in the process and where how it came back. Those CAC members were worn out about hearing about an SAP. They were more concerned about how we would look as a community if we didn't pay. Well, that's not, I don't do that in my day-to-day -day living, and I don't want to see irresponsible, the, uh, the CAC be irresponsible or the CRA be irresponsible with taxpayer dollars and paying that. To me, excuse me, piss poor subpar plan. There was a contract, you were supposed to do it. It's the principle, adhere to what you were paid to do, and they did not do that. That wouldn't have been accepted anywhere else except East Tampa, nor would that process to weigh them down and keep bringing it back would have been acceptable either. So again, I'm just asking you to say no or send it back or make the contractor adhere to what they were paid to do. Um, the pre-development program, as she, uh, I submitted it to the Economic Development Subcommittee, not only would this program work with some uh, members of the community that served it in various capacities, over 40, some of them 50, some of them even 60 years, they've been in East Tampa. So I want to see, I want to bring a different standard to East Tampa because the, the mindset is, it's, oh, it's East Tampa. So it's subpar, just like we accepted that SAP. I want development to be different. I want us to have the opportunity to give a wow factor. This program will help eliminate blight. Some of them are blighted. Code enforcement fines everywhere. Uh, the police department just issued one uh, citation and de de you know, allowing development to take place and working with them on the soft cost of development will help, like I said, eliminate blight. It will increase the economic impact and it will assist in providing um, housing, some of them, their mixed use. It will provide housing in the middle of a crisis. And most of all, I'm more so impressed by the fact that I went because again, quality is important for development. I don't want to see inexperienced development. I don't want to see, you know, subpar development. I don't want to see city contractors as fines and doing bad business already in the city. So I went and found a multi million dollar developer that's willing to give back. They're located in East Tampa, black owned building hospitals, the gym, the Glacier Museum. They built some of the malls, the airports. They're built everywhere in Tampa. They're located in East Tampa, they're black in East Tampa, and they're going to help some of these trades that can't seem to get past, you know, offering pro quality products. They're gonna do training and allow them to assist in the development process as we collectively transform East Tampa. I submit to you, that's a wow. That's, that's a wow, multi-million dollar development, training and empowering, and we're offering a solution to this housing crisis. So I'm asking you to look at that and say yes to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. City of Tampa, and council member. I'm Richard Romeo, uh, 1309 East North Bay, Tampa, Florida. On approximately uh, the 10th of August, I was cleaning up my property and um, code enforcement came by and said, asked me, he said, aren't you a little bit too late doing that? And uh, shouldn't you have uh, been all, done all this since last week? And uh, he also stated that uh, why I wasn't at a hearing last week. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez advised me that I have a fine going on on my property, which I was never notified that um, I had a court date or a hearing. I did not get a letter or, or anything of that nature. Um, I affirmed that um, 
I did not get anything at all, no notice, no phone call, anything at all. And uh, I'm humbly requesting that I given a fair opportunity and time to correct whatever the city asked me to do before this sign, this fine accumulate. Your property is, as you say, in compliance? And no. This, is, this it, has nothing to do with, with this board. But. I was going to say, unfortunately, the code enforcement process is not administered by this board. It's done through Chapter 162 and the code enforcement magistrate. So this, and, the, and they're sitting as a CRA board, not even a city council. So they don't have any authority to address that issue specifically today. Um, obviously, we can get you, and, and Ms. Travis is here, and others can get you in touch with city staff to try to address the issue. Um, and I, I don't know where you are in the process, but we'll, uh, we can definitely. Uh, well, what can I do at this point? Because, like I said, I was notified and fines are running and starting, I think, was last week on my property. So, so not, none of, they can't help okay. you with that. Yeah, what okay. I'm going to do is give you my card. Uh -huh. And I want you to call my office or send me an email. And I'll have my assistant work with you and connect you with the, with the code enforcement office and we could get that looked at and taken care of for you. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm Nicole Travis. Here's phone, call that phone number and I'll have my assistant. I'm going to text her right now to look out for a call from you. Okay. And we'll connect you with the right people. All right. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, is there anyone else that wishes to speak on public comment today? Um, we don't have anyone online. So uh, we will move forward. Um, you know what? Um, yes, yes. Uh, so we have moved um, item number uh, six up. So we are um, going to be looking at the budget. Good morning again, Council. If I could get the PowerPoint presentation for the budget planning. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation recently at your budget workshop and um, about CRA funds. And I want you to know that the CACs work very hard to put together a proposal that, um, or allocate funds that meshes with their redevelopment plan, as well as what they're projected to do in the next fiscal year. There are um, new revenues, ad valorem tax revenues. You'll see there's about 12 million. You have 10, what, 12.6 million. There's $10.6 million that could be allocated to housing programs if you want that. The $2 million that's out of that is already committed to Water Street um, projects. So I didn't want, that's already committed. Um, so I'm gonna just ro run through the presentation real quick. And just stop me along the way if you have any questions. And so the total increment revenues for fiscal year 23, we're projecting at 57914000 million. Um, that's a, you'll see that that's a 28% increase over all the districts from the previous fiscal year. This is how the, your budget was um, allocated in fiscal year 22, you had about 10.3% um, going towards affordable housing initiatives, and then 33% going to redevelopment investments. District programs and services had about 12%, 4.5% um, to operations and administration, and then capital improvement projects took the remaining uh, portion of the balance. And based on the allocations that we've worked with the CACs, this is what that um, allocation looks like. 3.9% for affordable housing initiatives, redevelopment investments, about 20.5%, district programs and services, 11.7%, um, operations and administration is 4.2%, and then capital improvement projects is around 60%. So first we're going to talk about the downtown CRA. Um, there's about 23, almost $23 million in the downtown CRA um, expected revenue. And what you have before you is how we project to use that, um, allocate those funds. We are going to finish working on fiscal, excuse me, the community redevelopment plan for 2023 to 2030. There's a plan for the Riverwalk and Franklin Street overlay. 
um, finish the Herman Massey Park and the Kid Mason Center is also included in this budget. Continue the urban CRA wayfinding project and continue working on the Union Station Rehabilitation and Public Art Project. Um, there is funds to fund an annual public art. Financially prepare for the Jackson House renovation. Um, there are some improvements and upgrades to lighting into the bridge on for Harbor Island Boulevard. Plan the Likes Gaslight Park redevelopment. Explore beneficial bridge river walk connection. <coughs> and plan self-funding workforce housing programs and to begin contractually with the Stras and Convention Center funding. So next we have the Channel District. Channel District has $10.2 million. Um, their funding finished the purchase of the, for the green space, you purchased the RV lot this year, finished developing that green space and open space is a part of our budget objectives for the next fiscal year. Um, finish redeveloping the aquarium's parking lot. Finish the um, Cumberland improvements and parking. That's a GMP contract that we have. Continue the urban CRA wayfinding project. Washington Park renovations, we're gonna start that. An annual funding of public art in this area. Enhanced landscaping to the public realm. Continue the green and open space development. And the Channel District Main Street Program and self-funding work, workforce housing program. So the Tampa Heights Riverfront CRA, a lot less um, in their, for their funding. That's about $1.8 million. So the CRA Wayfinding Project is a multi-district project. We'll continue working on that. Um, Palm Avenue Public Art Project, we'll try to wrap that up in this fiscal year. Develop a CRA plan based on comprehensive grant programs. Uh, begin an annual public art allocation Again, self-funding for workforce housing programs. Plan Waterworks Park Crosswalk is a part of this plan, or this budget cycle. The Central Park CRA is the smallest little budget. Um, and about $250,000. And with Central Park, again, that cross-boundary um, CRA wayfinding project um, begin the CRA plan based on comprehensive grant programs, annually funding public arts, also working on workforce housing programs, purchase and secure historic Central Avenue properties, the Johnson Homes Renovation Partnership with the Tampa Housing Authority that's on Scott Street. You've heard about that. So now we're gonna move into the Ybor City CRAs. So in Ebor, you have $3.2 million um, in the Ebor 1 7th Avenue brick cost feasibility study is something that's programmed in this budget. The Centennial Park Master Plan, um, advanced community identified priorities from the Ebor Vision 2020 plan. It's a five year strategic plan to achieve economic development initiatives to promote the Ebor City safe, clean, and attractive historic district visitors, business, and residents. And then 7th Avenue Iconic Archway Light Preservation and Streetscape Enhancement Project is a part of this budget. And as you know, we have more than one um, Ebor CRA. And so in District two, we're gonna to continue to encourage residential infill development and the rehabilitation of historic structures in Ebor neighborhoods. Continue to fund key development incentives to stimulate private investment and attract businesses to serve residents' needs as well as bolster community amenities. And to complete the East 7th Avenue streetscape and monument projects to establish an Eastern gateway into Ebor City. And that's projected in the $1.4 million in the just Second District of Ebor. East Tampa CRA, our largest district. 
We're gonna continue to creating affordable housing options. There's grant funded programs for homeowners and small businesses in East Tampa. Um, we're gonna continue the aesthetics and beautification within East Tampa CRA neighborhoods and along the boundaries. Um, in fiscal year 23, we're highlighting that, um, trying to see if we could get a grant writer, um, continue to do business assistance grants, affordable housing grants, public art projects, gateway projects, and investment in youth programming. This is something that we've talked, spoken to you about um, several times. East Tampa's projected budget is $8.9 million. Next, we have the Drew Park CRA. Key projects for the fiscal year 23 for Drew Park is move forward with the development of the CRA owned residential lots for affordable housing. Continue developing economic development opportunities in the district that assist businesses, support job creation, improve the appearance of Drew Park through facade improvement grant programs. Design phase two improvements of Tampa Bay Boulevard, linear park and designs for a new neighborhood park along Hubert Avenue. Initiate streetscape aesthetics and safety improvements along Lewis Avenue and Grady Avenue, including the roundabout. And then also initiate uh, mobility, sidewalk connectivity, and safety improvements throughout the Drew Park CRA boundary. And that's within our $2.3 million projected for fiscal year 23. The West Tampa CRA. Oops. Sorry. The West Tampa CRA district, the key redevelopment objectives for this fiscal year is that the CAC wants to support housing and housing rehabilitation, infrastructure and economic development, business improvement grants. Those business improvement grants are for the physical appearance of the buildings. Support the West Tampa facade, vanilla shell restaurant and food services, upstairs residential grant programs. Update the West Tampa overlay code revision Redevelop South Seams, South Seams, South Salcinas. South Salcinas. I thought it was pronounced differently. Salcinas Park and Ray Park in partnership with the city's Parks and Recreation Department. Conclude the West Tampa CRA parking study in the partnership with the city and pond and company. Support a year round Main Street area clean team and an alley improvement pilot program. And that's projected in the $6.6 .6 million uh, for the West Tampa CAC budget. Um, the CRA uh, board approval of the budget book and the service level agreement is, could be done on September 8th. Um, I need to talk to you a little bit about the service level of, um, agreement uh, based on the hiring of a director. And so that doesn't have to be done at um, that budget meeting, but there's some things that's happening concurrently. But Nonetheless, we would like the CRA board to approve or give us some direction from this meeting so that your budget can be approved at that next meeting. Council Member Maniscalco. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I know we, on Tuesday, touched on a couple of topics, affordable housing being the biggest and most crucial. And of course, you know, we can have discussion and, and make decisions or give direction today to how much we're gonna allocate towards affordable housing. I know East Tampa is the biggest CRA. Mm -hmm. Uh, and may be the most affected uh, in regards to where the, necess the necessity is everywhere, mm -hmm. but um, you did show numbers of an $8.9 million budget for East Tampa. Mm -hmm. My question is what is available there and in other uh, CRAs that we can, get available funding that we can allocate towards affordable housing? That's one part, and I know it's gonna be a bigger discussion. Second, I had to get my glasses because I couldn't see, so I came back in. In regards to downtown, mm -hmm. uh, I missed that slide. Did you mention the Museum of Art? I heard the Stras, but did you mention the Museum of Art? I don't know that I mentioned the museum. I, I don't think, think it's programmed for fiscal year 23. An allocation for the Museum of Art, although I believe they, have, they are going to request yeah. that we do something similar to what was provided for the Stras in connection with their. I don't and, think, and yeah. it, but it, it won't be today. It won't be discussed no. today. No. Okay, so no. well, I'll leave that uh, apart. So we'll focus on um, that affordable housing. Um, you know, we talked about the sure. $36, $37 million total yeah. and what, you know, with the general uh, fund and then the CRA budget separate, but. 
So what, what can we do? Sure. So one of the things um, I mentioned it probably in the previous workshop, you have $10.6 million of new ad valorem revenue um, that could be allocated towards housing if you wanted to. Drew Park, West Tampa, and East Tampa are the three CRA districts that have allocated 80% of that new revenue to housing programs. I would say that East, I probably would contend that East Tampa probably is the one that has the most programming towards um, housing already. If you, if the desire of the board is to allocate the $10.6 million across all CREs, because I would have to go through and break down each allocation for each district. If your direction is for us to use that $10.6 million towards housing pro programs, we'll go back and take that allocation and just put it in a bucket for housing initiatives. Any new programming um, or however we're going to spend that money would come back to the board anyway. But if you just allocate it for housing, um, affordable housing programs, we can do that now and that would help you get to the budget um, budget approval timeline. So, and, and I'll stop, stop here. You know, just like we tried to maneuver COVID, it was a crisis scenario and we took it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Here, this crisis is the affordable housing. Are we gonna solve it? Is there a perfect answer? No, but I think we need to uh, do what we can at the maximum level, as you've already explained, as we maneuver this crisis until things get better, should they get better, and I hope that they will get better as it, inflation adjusts and the cost of goods and the cost of everything, you know, re-regulates itself. So, you know, are we gonna solve it? Did we declare a housing state of emergency? Did we do it? No, but we're using the tools that we can and taking it one day at a time, and this today is that day where we can, you know, offer direction. So, um, you already mentioned 80%, you'll have to look at the other yeah. CRAs and then yeah, rework the numbers, but we should take it to the maximum level of investment that we can put into affordable housing. Council Member Carlson. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, it, 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 you may know a couple years ago this board um, passed a, a resolution to request that staff spend 30% of CRA money across the board. Well, I wasn't aware that there was a resolution. And okay. your predecessors didn't do that. Okay. Um, uh, so now we're, that, that would have only solved part of the problem. There's no way we can build 50,000 units within four years um, and make up for all the ones that were torn down in the last 10 years. But um, uh, I brought this up before a couple years ago. Um, you know, CRAs by law are meant to solve slum and blight. There is no slum and blight in downtown or channel district now. And uh, it, uh, the, I can tell you people in other parts of the city that are subsidizing the downtown and channel district CRAs don't want to do it anymore. They think it's unfair that, that downtown and channel district get amenities that they don't get. And um, it also doesn't make sense from a policy point of view. As I've said before, I think CRAs are for lazy policy people because um, what we should be doing is allocating money to places like East Tampa anyway, not forced to do it through a CRA. And it's not fair to think that the CRA in East Tampa is going to solve everything. And as you know uh, from your experience, CRAs generate money based on real estate development, and real estate development encourages gentrification. And so, like what the last administration did is they used the CRA money to subsidize gentrification so that we can get more money to subsidize gentrification. And um, I think we should keep them in everywhere except downtown and Channel District. East Tampa, West Tampa make perfect sense. Um, but in places like downtown Channel District, they've been a success where they've succeeded. Uh, but we, the most of the money, as you just showed, is coming from downtown. Um, I, I think, and I, I can make a motion now or later, but I think we ought to put a cap on the downtown and Channel District CRAs uh, before their, their regular conclusion, because we don't have slum and blight anymore. I mean, if somebody sued and said, you can't keep these anymore, it's not fair for the rest of Tampa to, to subsidize them because there's no slum and blight, we would probably lose that lawsuit. So um, uh, uh, we, what we should do is um, folks in Channel District have asked that we add a, that we leave a little bit in, like 10 or 20 percent, till the end of the term. But what I would suggest is that we take 80 or 90 percent of the money in downtown and Channel District and move it back to the general fund, and then request that City Council uh, set up a fund for affordable housing uh, that would receive that money. And of course, the mayor would have to cooperate with it, but. Uh, we can't, this board cannot control where the money goes, but the city council and the mayor can. 
And so if we commit on the other side to receiving that money and setting up a, a dedicated affordable housing fund, then we could move that money anywhere in the city that we need to. And we, should, we shouldn't have concentrations of poverty and only have it, uh, affordable housing in, in, in one neighborhood or one area. Uh, but it would give us a lot more flexibility to build affordable housing wherever we can instead of paying for the highest property prices to put affordable housing when we could get two or three times as many units if we put the money somewhere else. So I, I won't make a motion now unless somebody wants me to, but I, I think that we should seriously look at that. There's no way we're going to have enough money uh, to build the units. We need to think in terms of 50,000 units, not in terms of how much money we're spending. And that five or $10 million a year could go to a lot better use in some place besides downtown. Thank you. Council Member Miranda. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you uh, for one thing. First of all, notice one thing that you've done that very few do. When you hand us a page, uh, an item, it's got a page number, so we can find it real easy. Sometimes, most of the things we get here does not have a page number. You've got to keep turning pages until you find it. But when you see it on the board, you know what page you're in. It's easy for us to follow, or easier for us to follow. There's a couple of things. Uh, <coughs> landscaping, I know we need landscaping, and I appreciate that. But I'd really like to see where the landscaping becomes not only the cost of it, but the maintenance of it, sure. because we got to get broader, broader friendly <coughs> type of landscaping so that we can maintain them at a much lesser cost to promote more landscaping. Sure. Uh, it's only a suggestion. And on page <coughs> nine, you, there's a downtown development for uh, CRA for uh, 140,000 for the ferry. And I still say the ferry does very little to take any cars off the bridge. What it does do is give you an easy $10 to go to St. Pete and $10 to return, and the taxpayers are paying for it. And that's not the right thing to do, but that's just me. And uh, the next thing is on uh, page 40, I noticed something in that CRA that I didn't notice and the rest of the others, and I was checking them by page number, so I may have missed one or two of the CRAs. But on page 40, there's under the reinvestment, development reinvestment, we have residential exterior improvement grants for 300000 what does that mean? So those are your um, owner-occupied, well, not necessarily owner, but is that for, is that tenant-based places? Yes, yeah, West Tampa, is it tenant? Yes, yeah, for the improvement of um, residential structures for tenant or owner-occupied residential Is that structures. a total or just one? No, that's that's the total for the program. Oh, okay, because I said it, it didn't. I, I, no, I that's not just for, no, that's not just for one. When I read one. that 300,000 in business enhancement, 100 in business facade, 120, I want to make sure that that's just for, no, one, that, person, that's, for one party, is for many. No, it's for, it's a, for the program, okay, the funding I, I, and for the I program. I apologize, but I had to make sure. Thank you sure. very much, Ms. Travis. Um, Council Member Goods. Go to, go to downtown. Make sure I, I'm reading these right. Do you want this on the screen? Yeah, on the okay. screen. Okay. Total dollars that downtown has right now in the CR. Total dollars. Yep. Can you add that? 22.9. Can you pull up the slideshow for me, please? <coughs> it's page nine, yeah. So out of the 22.9, you're saying that, that they have in their bank, these are all their programs that are adding up to 22.9? 22.9 is how much they're having in revenue. So we have we did a zero sum budget. So whatever revenue we got in is what we're allocating in the programs. My concern when I look at channel and downtown is the number for housing. Sure. Um, absolutely. I, understand. I, I think I think that needs to be increased. <laughs> mm -hmm. Period. Uh, Mr. Carlson made that, and we made that resolution a long time ago in reference to that being done as far as these CRAs with those high numbers. And uh, he's right on that point. I mean, housing is a key point, and they have that type of money, more money in those CRAs, they need to go to housing. I can, so um, Councilman Maniscalco asked about how much increment each district, and you're asking about downtown. So downtown has the core and the non core, they have about Almost five million dollars in new increment. A million. Five. Sorry. Yeah. Four in the non-core and nine hundred and seven thousand in the downtown core. So I don't. If 
if the general direction is that you want us to allocate, I know you're looking at the breakdown of this and not seeing housing. If you want us to allocate the new revenue towards some kind of housing initiatives and housing program, we don't have to solve what that is right now. Let us take that back. We'll put it in a housing initiative buckets, just to your point, Councilman, and then we could come back and tell you um, how we will work with developers or how, how we're gonna work on towards housing on this. What Councilman um, Carlson was talking about, we would have to, I'll defer to Morris, but I think we'll have to do something with the, um, the overall plan and sunsetting. That's, the, that's, and that's, that's down the rest, that's a lot to do. But right now we're in a situation but right for, now. But so for I'm, right, I'm, now, right now, to your point, we can reallocate um, the fund. We can try to reallocate where we can. I know yesterday, we, uh, Tuesday, we talked about uh, another team. Yep. I think that's going to be important if we do that with these dollars here to make sure we have that team incorporated in that, if that's the case, uh, to move fast. Um, like I talked about the other day, uh, we have a lot of vacant units around here. Mm -hmm. we, talk, we got a crisis, but we got a lot of vacant units, which makes no sense to me at all. Uh, so I'm just uh, looking at we, adding money to, to housing. It's crucial. I know some people have some set programs that we can get away from, but I believe with the money that's coming in, I think you you got to look at taking the bulk of that, throwing at the housing. So just because um, I don't want to do it in a vacuum. We have had previous agreements. Um, there are programs and initiatives that you have approved throughout the year, right? And so we know roughly where they need allocations need to be, but whatever is not spent in the fiscal year, what I'm proposing is to come back to you probably in November with um, – with reallocation of what wasn't spent in this current fiscal year, and then we could reallocate those monies towards housing. I think we need to do a, a comprehensive study of where we're spending the money, what um, commitments we have out there. The Museum of Art came up, the Tampa, Tampa Theater is something that's hanging out there as well. So once I take all of those things into consideration, I understand if the intent and the direction from the board today is to take as much as possible to dedicate towards housing, I will take that charge and come back to you with the housing buckets in each one of the districts and show you how we'll allocate that money. And that may include, um, I said this to you at the workshop before, that I, we're at capacity, right? And if you add additional money towards housing programs, I need additional staff to help me to help us administer the housing programs and so um, that would be shared that's not at a cost that would not be at a cost to one CRA it would be shared amongst the districts now in, in previous years I've, I've went along with the ferry situation because it was it was CRA dollars and uh, kind of a small benefit uh, mm -hmm. but looking at this now I mean uh, we can use every dime we can get mm -hmm. Uh, and I know the ferry is a, uh, Mr. Morris, is that already, at, we, did we already approve that ferry already? We, I think it, we approved the, already? the timing for um, making a decision on the funding of the ferry, that's why the ferry discussion was brought to you in April because right. the timing for making that decision was in that time frame. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll yield back. Right. But to, to your point, moving forward, if that is something that the, if your general direction is to do less contributions to that. Whenever that agreement comes to place, we can make that known and start to make those adjustments moving forward. Yeah, I would, I would think now going forward, mm -hmm. I believe going forward, we have to look at that now dealing with the housing situation. Sure. Just so you, you just to remind you, relative to the ferry, uh, the way the interlocal agreement is structured is there is a period of time, I believe it's by June one, where a local government can decide that they do not want to further fund that program. That's why in April we had the presentation come before you all about, and, and, and that was the time for you all really to decide whether you wanted to continue funding the ferry out of CRA dollars. That will come back before you because you have a standing motion for them to present every year in April for you all to kind of determine at that point in time if, it's, if this is something that you feel that merits the, CR, the support of the downtown CRA tip dollars and that's where that money has been coming from. Understood. Okay, Council Member Citro. Thank you, Ms. Travis. Can you pull up page five again, which sure. shows the uh, the outline of the downtown CRA? Is that page five? Yes, ma'am. Six. I'm sorry, six. Uh, the, the whole shaded area there is that 
considered just for the public is that considered the downtown CRA yes yeah, so you have two two districts so you have the core and the not core um, both shaded green areas are is a downtown CRA so I you know that there is I'm not I tend not to give evidence but north of Cass Street there is a lot of vacant land down yeah. there and as this body did with the old Army Navy store mm -hmm. on Tampa Street that was bought specifically to for workforce housing. housing plus another five million put in mm -hmm. for infrastructure around the area in my opinion, that area north of Cass is prime mm -hmm. for Agreed. affordable workforce housing. Agreed. With CRA dollars, are we looking at a public-private development specifically for affordable workforce housing? And can our dollars be used to either purchase land and or develop it for affordable workforce housing? So the CRA dollars are going for slum and blight in yes. the downtown area. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Number two. Um, Tampa Heights, although it's one of the newest CRAs, there's so much investment going into that area. Why is there so little in the fund? And that's just my opinion. There is so much investment going on down there. Uh, it, it, it just seems to me that it's not, it's not up, it's not up to par. Uh, well. Is, is it because of recent opt-outs or? I would have to look at the, the role um, from the property appraiser just to see. Um, I can't answer that for you right now. I'd, I'll look at the role. The other thing I, I would mention to you relative to Tampa Heights is that we do have an agreement with the CDD that was established by the developer with Tampa Heights where virtually I think about 95% of the TIF dollars go to pay for the infrastructure improvements because that whole area, the whole street, grid structure, all of the stormwater sewers, the entire infrastructure was redone by the CDD. And so that is a Well, that's where your money is. That's where your money is. And that is an obligation between this body and the CDD that has a 30-year term. To Again, I, I don't like yeah. to give evidence. I'm glad somebody yeah. else did. Thank yeah. you, Ms. Travis. Madam Chair. Sure. Um, uh, oh, Councilmember yeah. Carlson and... and just to go back to a couple of comments my colleague said um, to uh, are we supposed to call these ourselves as a council member or board member here board member board, 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 technically board member oh, board member yes. board member goods um, talked about the ferry um, and I think maybe board member uh, um, Miranda did also if if I, we we shouldn't vote on it today but I think if if you all you all know I support that but I support the ferry but if if you all think we should cut the funding um, I think it would be respectful to give them as much time as possible. I would suggest that we set up a time in September, October, or, or as early as possible to have them come back. It is, uh, I think they would present that it's a, a marketing tool for downtown that brings passengers and business into downtown. Um, but at the end of that presentation, if you all think that it's not convincing and that we shouldn't do it, then I think we should tr indicate early months in advance that we're not going to refund it so they can try to negotiate something else. You saw the problem they had with Pinellas where they, they, they almost didn't get their funding and it just, the, the, the timeline on decisions is far out so it would be good if we did it early. The second thing is to board member Miranda's point about uh, sustainable um, landscaping. I don't know if we've ever done this before but I would encourage you to make a motion to require that CRE money only be spent on um, Florida or sustainable landscaping, uh, this seemed like a good idea to me. Um, why, if we're going to if we're going to spend money that the rest of the city is subsidizing, let's spend it on something that's really worthwhile. And I think the rest of the city would support that if you would ever want to make a motion. Thank you. I appreciate it very much, Councilmember Gates. Yeah, Mr. Travis, I don't. I've, I've, I've said it for a long time. One time I made a motion in reference to uh, workforce housing and the definition of that. Uh, I made some definitions. It came back and uh, essential worker, uh, and it came back essential worker could be anybody. And our workforce is our people who work at McDonald's, Burger King. Our workforce is not your fireman, your policeman, or your nurse, because I know what they make. And we use that word workforce all the time. And I, I wouldn't want to see that in any of our housing stuff, our serious thing. Because to me, to me, it sounds discriminatory. Workforce. I say so, attainable housing because attain, attainable housing is attainable to 
what's attainable to me is a different what's Correct. attainable to you. Correct. Right? And I, when you say I workforce, you. it seems like you're saying to a different class of sure. people. Sure. I just don't like that. Uh, I hear it all the time. Um, and if we're going to put money into housing, you know, everyone needs to have an opportunity to be in the house, to Absolutely. be in the apartment, whatever we're doing. Uh, I just, to me, when we say that word, it's like you're looking at a certain class of sure. people. And then those people at the bottom are still saying we're still left behind. And to me, it's what I call that, that gap, that gap, where I'm right there, but I'm being classified here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I like to see a different word used, uh, just my opinion. And, and Mr. Sitio, uh, uh, Sitio is right. When you go north, mm -hmm. it's a lot of property. I, I, I talked to Mr. Burton about that too. Uh, I talked to the downtown partnership about that as well. We need to start going that way, uh, building and looking at what we can do as far as housing uh, or, or entertainment, where you, you separate the two. Because when you, people are complaining about housing, entertainment, well, then you've got all this property up here. Then let's figure out a plan to, to, to separate it. Then you don't have these certain complaints. You can start to build upon whatever. But I would just say that uh, the, the word workforce to me shouldn't be there. It should be a different word to where, like you said, attainable. I can deal with that because it's, you're people are being able to attain right. what they need. So uh, that's all I'm saying, because I just don't like the word workforce. Understood, 100%. Board Member Citro. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, to, to just to touch on the, the Cross Bay Ferry, the ferries, there is the South Bay Ferry that I would still be in favor of supporting and that's moving military personnel from South Shore to the Air Force Base. So that I, I want to separate those two things out. Okay, then I get, I get a turn. Um, uh, I know it's this is this is difficult. I don't know how you do it because you want to jump in anyway. Um, I will agree with all of my colleagues. I mean, we absolutely the the thing that isn't easy to see in this budget is is exactly where the housing money is going. And I would 100% support the the 30% from the different CRAs going into housing. But particularly, I would echo the desire to look very closely at the downtown and channel side CRA and what monies are available, how could we put those toward housing? I would absolutely also support the hiring, the, the use of this money to hire staff to um, uh, help with the, uh, to focus on the CRA but work within um, the housing. housing. So I, uh, I appreciate this budget and I look forward to seeing what you can bring to us. Sure. So we're going to, we have a couple of CAC meetings that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, I think downtown, Channel Side, and West Tampa are happening within the next two weeks. Um, we definitely want to work with the CACs. We understand the directive. If there is a motion, we'll take that back to the CACs. And so I'm going to, we're going to make sure that the budget for when you approve it in September or when you start the public hearings in September that is adjusted the best way possible. What I would ask is that, um, that I also come back to you in November, that when we close out the current fiscal year, we can show you what hasn't been used and um, also take that opportunity to look at how we want to reallocate money and you want to probably reallocate to housing as well. So I'd like to do that. Um, with you for a September and then come back at the close once we close out the books for the current fiscal year if that's okay with you okay. what's the pleasure no anybody want to make a motion then I will make the motion for Miss Travis Second. request Can we? The, okay, the motion for me to present a yeah. budget yes. to you in September yes. okay. 6th yes. at your public hearing yes with as much housing as possible and come back with reallocations in the November meeting with any uh, unused or unappropriated surplus for housing programs in November. Thank you for articulating my point so well. <laughs> uh, motion made by board member Citro, seconded by board member Maniscalco. Um, do we need a roll call for this? Yeah, Let's roll call. roll call, please. Let's do a roll call. Yes. Yes. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Oh. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertak? Yes. Y motion carried with Vieira being absent. 
Um, yes, Council I, Member Carlson. I just want to oh, ask, sorry, I, I won't make a motion, but I'll just ask Ms. Travis. Um, when you come back with the budget, it, with all the numbers that we can spend on housing, mm -hmm. the biggest part of it is going to be downtown mm -hmm. and maybe Channel District. Could you please also, just just as an aside, show us the, if, how much we could get for our dollar if we spent the equivalent amount of money somewhere else in the city? Uh, because if it turns out that that the the, the land um, uh, over by Army Navy is is the same cost per acre as somewhere else, and we can get the same number of units, then it would make sense to put there. If it's only 10 or 20 percent higher, it might make sense to put it there. But if we could get on the other extreme, if we could get two or three times more units somewhere else, then that would make the case that it that we that we move, move the money back to general okay. fund. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, then. Uh, Councilman, uh, um, Board Member Citro. No, I, I will speak with Ms. Travis later. Thank okay. You, um, I just received a memo from a Board Member Vieira. There is a serious traffic accident that has shut down portions of the interstate, so he will not be able to attend today. So he is requesting to continue items three, four, and nine until the next CRA session. To, oh, it would be September? Yeah. September 8th. Three, four, and nine to the September CRA. Okay. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. Well, motion made by a board member Maniscalco and seconded by board member Goods. Um, I want to make sure that doesn't interfere with any. Yeah. Yes. So let's. Yes. So the motions were made. Go ahead and. I just want to make sure that that doesn't interfere with anything that's pertinent. It has to be done mm -hmm. today or tomorrow. Or whatever. No, we're good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. We're clear. Okay. So yes. Um, so all in favor of continuing Aye. the items until September. Aye. Aye. Okay. Madam Chair, may I do a couple of housekeeping Absolutely. Um, items before you move on to your agenda? Um, board members, the October um, CRA board meeting is scheduled the same time as our Florida Redevelopment Association conference. That is a big conference that is used for training. It's a really great opportunity um, for staff, and they are all going to participate. Um, Jeff Burton is also the president um, of the FRA Association and will not be here for that meeting. We don't have any um, time-sensitive items to present to you in October. I did work with the clerk's office to look at um, your agenda, your evening agendas, and trying to try to reschedule it, and your agendas are kind of packed. So my recommendation would be to cancel the October CRA meeting um, because staff will be at conference at, starting October 3rd, October 12th through the 14th. I mean, that, we do have a public schedule of CRA meetings. We'd have to uh, notice that on both the clerk's website and that's the desire. I think also provide uh, publish notice that we're canceling the meeting. I'm sure. So that's doable, yes. if that's um, the pleasure of the board. Board member Goods. I don't recall ever getting the information about the do. About, do we have inf is there information out there about this conference? About the FRA conference, yes. there is, and we I'll be happy to send it to you. Send it to. You. Okay, we'll we'll send it to you all um, all the registration information and, and what you'll do is just let me know if you would like to attend. Um, we could make sure that you're registered and their accommodations are sure. Um, council, uh, board member Carlson. I think, if I remember correctly, that we're all automatically members, like the city pays for yes. or something, because I've attended uh, virtual conferences with yes. them before. Um, the city, so we have a we have a membership um, as a city, but you have to pay for the conference. So if you want to attend the conference, and I'll tell you just um, from being a re redevelopment professional, it's one of the best conferences in the state. Um, it gives you ideas of how other cities are handling redevelopment programs, um, different financing options. It's just. It's a really informative conference. Where is it? Where is, it uh, is it in Daytona? Beach. Daytona Beach this year. Daytona Beach. Field it's beach. usually central. -ish. There. Home of the world's famous beach. <laughs> well, Madam Chair, if I may, I oh, have been to yes. this conference several several times, and it is it is a fantastic uh, uh, time. A lot, wealth of information. Okay. Do, do we have any motions about this? Do you have a motion to cancel? So moved. Second. Okay, motion made by board member Citro and seconded by board member Maniscalco. Uh, roll call vote. Yes. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Citro. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Vieira is absent. Hertak. Yes. Uh, 
Motion carried with absent, uh, Viera absent at vote. Thank you. Um, and then I have one other item for you just as an update. The last, at the last CRA board meeting, um, we told you that we published for your CRA director position. We published it, we have advertised the director position. We've received 30 responses, but we have one qualified applicant of the 30 responses. And so professionally, I have to, <laughs> yes, I'll have to recommend um, to you that um, there's, you have a number of options. We could continue to advertise it and try to market it a little more heavily. Um, we can move forward um, with the one qualified applicant. I just, from a professional standpoint, I think that you should have, you should have options. Um, the only thing that's imminent at this time is that you have approved for me to be your interim CRA director until the end of September. And I just want to put it before you so that you have options. I would be more than happy to continue to do that. Um, just as we're backing into time, we told you that we would do a public meet and greet for you and for the community and for the CAC members for um, just to meet the finalists in that project. And as we back into that, we're running up against the expiration of um, my interim status. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not kicking you to the curb. I just want you to know what the timing is and so that you understand. And I pride myself on doing what I say I'm going to do. And so I just want to be able to present you with options. We would be happy to continue marketing, um, um, pushing um, and doing a broader outreach so that we present you with a few um, qualified candidates. Board member Citro. Then I would like to make a motion that Ms. Travis stays director until which time we find a, a new app, new director. I would recommend I would recommend that we just add 30 days because we need to light a fire under HR to find this position. Um, I, I like you and you've done a great job, um, uh, but we need this is a separate entity and we need a mm -hmm. we need a, a separate um, executive director. The other thing I'll say while I have the floor is that um, other boards like the airport port and others. Um, the board members individually interview the person. Last time we didn't have a chance to do that. It came up suddenly, um, at least I was blindsided, I don't know about everybody else, but um, I, I think we, we need to have one-on-one -on -one time to talk to the folk, who, folks and, and give them a fair chance, not just have them meet in, in, a, in a public round. Remember the, the, the uh, police chief uh, discussion was like that, and in fact one candidate wasn't able to attend, and so it was very controversial. It would be better to uh, since the community is watching this, that we that we spend the appropriate time to find the right person. Council, um, board member Goods. There, there are two good points here. I think Mr. Carlson is right about extending it 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, what I've seen so far, I, I'm, I'm an action person. I'm not a talker. Uh, I think you got a person that's here. And from what the action I've seen, what I call your right-hand man has been doing that job. Uh, I, I see knowledge, uh, aggressiveness. Uh, and I don't know how we can flip it or what have you, or you know, people are paid for what they're worth. But I, I think that you, you, since you've been here, you're, have been, you have been assembling a team. And I wouldn't want to break the whole team. I wouldn't want to break the team up, but be able to keep the team. And even if that person on the team still answers to this board, at least I know the team is there and there's a relationship with the team. Uh, that's just my spin on it. I'll let other, chi other chi uh, members chime in, but I think you got a team. I think you got another person here who's come in who's really, really made it move. Uh, the community is happy with it on all fronts. And I think that's great when they're happy. They're not, you talk about they're angry. You know, they're angry because nothing even happened. And now people are seeing things happen. They ain't angry. Uh, so uh, that's my spiel on that. But I'll sit back here with the councilman. Board member Miranda. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate every everyone comment by the board members here. However, you have to make the application. And let me tell you what some of those problems can arise at. That individual or group of individuals that are working now may be reluctant to get that job, to apply for that job. I was once faced with that decision and I turned my position down because I really needed to work back in the 70s. 
and the prior three managers had lasted six months and they were dismissed. So the agreement that I made with the boss was that if I was dismissed, I go back to my regular job. And that might be why they're not applying. I'm not saying that's the reason, but I can tell you from experience, you have to make a choice and you look down the lane and you say, what happens if this choice doesn't work? Where do I go? I just moved here, I gotta move somewhere else or whatever. So it's a one that's on the minds of the individuals that are applying, that are saying, what happens if it does not work? And that's why maybe no one's applied from within. So I, I agree with uh, the time period for a delay, but I think we have to set a time certain like the end of the year, and any time that you find one within that year, certainly we stop there and, and everything is copacetic. So that, that's how my personal feeling is. They're not applying maybe, because they feel that if they're not Accept that later on they have nowhere to go. And that's a very dangerous thing to do to an individual. Thank you very much. Board Member Maniscalco. What if there is no uh, candidate better than yourself? I mean, I praised you on Tuesday uh, as a superstar and the team that you've assembled, as Councilman uh, Goo's already mentioned, you're fantastic. You go above and beyond. I understand there should be a separation, but I think we have the best candidate in front of us. And I'm saying that, I know there's 30 other applicants and one is qualified, whatever, meets the, meets the requirements, but you've done a wonderful job. So that's just my opinion. But if there's a 30 day extension, I get it, but I'm satisfied as w uh, where we're at now, so. Um, board member Citro. Thank you, uh, I, I can change my motion. Uh, I only said until which time just in case something unforeseeable comes up and that we have to go a few days longer or shorter than 30 days. But I will amend my motion to say 45 days if that suffices to everybody's uh, uh, wishes. Okay. Board Member Goods. My only problem is I, I don't want to overload Ms. Travis. She's got a lot going on. We're still running the other city projects and you're talking about eight CRAs. Uh, I'm still in the mindset she has a right hand. I think it, somehow we can we can maneuver that, I believe, to where that right hand can handle those CR issues and still be uh, a, a joint unit at the hip dealing with still other city issues. But I just don't want Ms. Travis to get burned out on trying to be aggressive to dealing with a housing situation that we have, also trying to hire more people for the housing situation, and still running other infrastructure deals and negotiations with the city. That's my only concern, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, but I, I think you, you got a right hand and somehow maybe we can, we can twist and bend that to make that work, in my opinion. Um, yes, <laughs> board member Carl, Carlson. Sorry to make you wait, but I know you wanna get last quote. Um, yeah, like I said before, I think Nicole and her team are doing a great job and I, I appreciate that. But as uh, board member Good said, you've got a whole other bigger portfolio and as, a, as city council, we need you to be able to work your magic on that portfolio too. Um, you know, we have complaints almost every day from everybody from, uh, from individual homeowners to huge developers that are complaining about the permitting process, about, about the, the, the other processes that you oversee. And you're going in and changing all of that. You're personally working with people. Every complaint I can afford to you and you personally handle it. Um, and so thank you for that. But all of that, those permitting processes are holding up our economy and we can't, afford, uh, uh, we can't afford to slow that down. We need to follow all the processes, but we need to fix the processes so they move faster and they're more effective. And then the other thing is we need to fix economic development. And you and I have talked about this before. The underlying problem, that the reason why we have a housing problem is because people can't afford it. And the reason why they can't afford it is that economic development in the city for at least the last 10 or 12 years has been focused on subsidizing big companies and high paying jobs, not on middle class and, and, and poor people. And you, if you check the census data, the, the, um, the middle class shrank most of the last 12 years. And we can't allow that to happen. The disparity between blacks and whites, the disparity between men and women have increased. And she's got, a, she's got that on her shoulders also. That's the biggest problem. If we fix that problem, we won't have an affordable housing problem. Yeah. Uh, because we'll, we'll have people who can afford to pay rent and, and most importantly buy homes. And so I, I, I would love for you to clone yourself and work on all these things, but um, if you can help us find somebody really good uh, to, to run this, that would be great. Thank you. 
board member Goots. What is the salary for the CRA director? Well, I know you were going to ask me that. I don't know. Yeah, at the top of the range is about 165. 165? That's, yeah, the top of the range is 165. I can offer a suggestion. Um, sorry, you had another question? No, I, I Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just going to offer a suggestion that um, I heard what you said. We have, um, we do have a qualified applicant, um, and I understand what you're saying about the team. Give me an opportunity, opportunity to go back and try to provide you with some options or try to figure something mm -hmm something out um, and I can meet with you individually to kind of talk through I've heard some of the comments you want to meet the candidates or just I can't be creative right now I'm also not feeling well <laughs> so I, I'm not thinking straight but um, if you give me the opportunity we'll continue to advertise the position but also try to be a little allow me to be a little creative in um, what this may, structure might look like Board member Kitch. if you interview 30 and out of 30, you got one that you feel is the prime. I mean. Well, we didn't interview 30. Okay. We got 30. We got 30 responses. 30 responses. And okay. one, which is an internal, met the requirement, the minimum requirements for the position. So I have just, I'm going to be very clear. We, we have like no managers minimum. We from to exceed. low. We need no minimum. We need to exceed. <laughs> no, well, exceed. Well, they exceed. They don't. But I'm just saying the other 29 candidates didn't meet the qualifications. And you have managers from Home Depot that are applied oh, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So this is what I'm telling you. But I, but from, from an executive position, I, I always try to present you with options. I want you to make the most, the best decision with the information that you have. And I'm trying to provide you with as much information and options as possible. I don't feel like I would be doing my job or doing this board in a service. I feel like I'll be doing you a disservice if I didn't present you with as many options as possible. So I've heard the comments. I can go back and be um, try to just allow me to think about it um, for a little bit, and I can meet with each of you individually to get your thoughts and come back to you with a proposal. Um, um, I, I guess I'll have uh, a moment. Uh, I think that that's a good idea. I know um, you and I also talked about uh, how we. Um, I think what makes this this position so difficult is we are also looking for people who understand Florida yes. CRA, and that that uh, precludes, I believe, a national search. search. That's correct. Um, because we don't want to be teaching right. too much. Yeah. But I did say that it, if there's a possibility of finding people who have Florida CRA experience and have moved on to other states, um, might be an area we might be able to um, find. Uh, possibly more candidates. The one Mr. thing Massey. I just was going to mention is that she is serving as interim CRA director until the end of September. So you do have the September meeting for her to maybe provide an update where she September. is with the search, what options may be available to you all that time, and whether her term as interim director may need to be extended, perhaps, depending on the circumstances. So that. I'm not sure you necessarily have to make a decision today. So I just offer that. Yeah. Okay. Then I, I, I will go back to my original motion, till which time a, a new director is found. Second. Well, I think what he's saying, yeah, that you didn't have to make that decision today. You have one more chance to make that decision. Okay. So you could rescind your motion. I'll rescind. I'll, I'll take my motion back. But if I may, Madam Chair, Ms. Travis, you hide your superhero cape very, very well. But thank you. Um, is that go, it? Go okay. home. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to leave you in very good and capable hands uh, today. Please don't hesitate to call me if you guys need anything. I appreciate you. We hope you feel better soon. Thank you. Okay. I think we're on to item number five. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Elise Drumgo, Deputy Administrator for Development and Economic Opportunity. Uh, agenda item number five, we have staff reports. Up first will be Jeff Burton with the uh, core CRAs. Good morning. Waiting for the slide. There. Next slide. Ooh. 
Next slide. <laughs> We're stuck. Uh, thanks, sir. There we go. Uh, right now, this month, the downtown CRA, uh, we're doing a, uh, all four of the urban CRAs, we're doing a validation of the boundaries using uh, USF, uh, Masters in Urban and Regional Planning Department. This is just uh, to make sure that all the boundaries are where they're supposed to be. Uh, some of the plans are much older, and we want to make sure that, that, that everything is correct. Uh, we're also in the process of a wayfinding plan consultant search. Uh, we're working with uh, contract management. We're doing a pick three, and that process is going along very well. We have a team of uh, other city staffers in mobility and other departments that will be working with us to uh, get that underway. We have money funded this year for that project, and we have money funded in the budget that you just saw for the actual construction of the signs and their placement. So this is a, a two-budget item. First we do the consulting and then we do the actual installation. Um, the Community Advisory Committee has recommend, uh, recommends Kittleson. That vote was taken uh, to, to write the new downtown redevelopment plan. Uh, this is not an update. This is not taking the existing uh, plan and just making some amendments to it. This is a complete rewrite. Uh, the CAC has also recommended and voted unanimously uh, on, the, on the fee for the plan. Um, the money's already in the budget. Uh, we were waiting for some signatures from the consultant. We wanted to get it to you today, but we'll wait till the September meeting, which is only a few weeks away. Uh, the CRA staff uh, is also working with the partnership on creating a plan for a sustainable Franklin Street pedestrian corridor and also an east-west corridor that has not been decided yet. We're talking with multiple city departments and we're also looking at um, financing, how to make that work so it's completely done uh, and it's uh, something to be extremely proud of. Um, we also have money and we're working with arts and culture on uh, the, a, uh, the sculpture, the, the artwork that goes into the Tampa Union Station that is in the budget. And you asked for an update on Kid Mason uh, Center. Uh, we went and looked yesterday in Excella, and they are down to two items that have to be approved. And I was told- Jeff, come on, man. Gee whiz. I understand. That's better than 70. So we are down to two items and they are currently working to get them out of the way so the permit can be issued and we can go out to an RFP. So just a little more patience is appreciated. I'm, I'm confused there. I thought we already went out for an RFP for this company or whoever to start. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm lost now. Right, so the architect, the, the, the city chose, the, the CRA chose the architect to do the redesign. The architect has been working with the development services uh, Maybe since when I got here, there were 70 items on the list that needed to be repaired and fixed on the plans. We are down to two. Once those plans have been approved by the development, by the development services, uh, then we'll be able to go out for, for a contractor. That's what we're, we've been waiting on the plans and the permits. So we're almost there with that and we will then turn around and put that out for bid. I'm just going to say that, I mean, you know, I, I know, I, I don't know the situation that's going on with this particular con uh, architect or whatever, but this is way unacceptable. This has been in 2019, and this is, I mean, this, that's unacceptable. I'm just sorry. I understand, uh, And if sir. that's the case, that person should have been uh, let go of that contract or whatever, and, and it should have went out to somebody else, but uh, no, no matter, <laughs> I just say this is unacceptable. I'm sorry. And, and, and that's what a lot of people complain about these projects you know, get back, back law, back law, back law, and people are like, well, what's going on? We just can't continue to let that happen. But I just, those are just my comments. So it's down to two, but I'm just saying it needs to be a push on this. Yes, sir. The, uh, also, the, uh, the money is budgeted for that, and we also included an extra 250000 250 or 500000 in this next budget in case we have escalation in prices. So we wanted to be prepared for that because we should just expect it. We've done that for both Herman Massey and for Kid Mason. We go back to the slides. Okay. Channel District, we're also doing the, uh, the, the, the boundary surveys. They were doing them for all four. We're doing the wayfinding for all four. 
the, uh, the community advisory has discussed a local employee workforce housing program. So what this is, is this is to put the employees who work in the area, who work in Channel District or even in uh, downtown, in the location and to live where they work. This is, would be a self-funding program, which means that we would work with developers who are coming online to uh, guarantee so many market rate units to the CRA and we would work with uh, the, the housing department and we would, and I, I concur, if we do this, we will need to have a staff member in, built into the housing department to manage this, to put those workers into those units so they don't have to drive all the way in from some other location. There was a survey that was done when I first got here and it said the two biggest problems in the city were lack of housing and long routes to get to housing. And if you think about it, they're the same thing. They're exactly the same thing. If, if we have housing in the downtown and the Channel District, then we don't have the long commutes. The other thing is, is the statute's very clear. It says slum and blight, absolutely. Or a lack of affordable housing in the area or the need for crime prevention. So that's what the statute says, and if there's one thing I have learned about Channel and District, there's a lack of affordable housing. There's a lack of workforce housing. I tend to like to use uh, the federal government definitions, which is based on average median income, usually about 120% AMI. So we will be working to bring you a policy and even a program and how to fund it to bring the workers into the areas where they can walk to work and even think about using the streetcar to get them so they might not be that close, but they could use, and we want people to use that streetcar. That's why we fund it, to make it free. We need more people, more bodies on that streetcar. Uh, the CA, the CA, uh, yes. No, go. Uh, anyone? I actually have a question about that. Um, I would really love to see you focus on 80% um, or lower because 120% AMI five years ago was something, but today it really isn't because we have such a higher AMI due to the to the businesses we are getting and, and the people, um, the increases in, in salaries. So if you could focus on the folks who are really doing the jobs that people in channel side need them to do 120 is not going to we'll bring you we'll bring you a a uh, results we can actually create an adaptive spreadsheet where we can plug in the right percentage and you can see the differences in how much how many units we can gain with the money that we have and then the board can decide that they might want to um, do both and just spread it between both so okay because there are people who work in the downtown and, and channel district that make 80% AMI or less. Yeah, I yeah. think the program okay. needs to have some detail filled in. Mm -hmm. And what we need to tie it to is actually the state definition of affordable housing, mm -hmm. which does have income levels. 120% does meet, I think, a certain level of what's deemed affordable. But they also have graduated levels of mm -hmm. medium, low. I think 80% yep. is the medium uh, level. And so we can. As we, yeah. as we roll out the program, we can define what those levels are and what you all would be willing to put the CRA funding toward. In the Absolutely. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, I, you know, I've been a big advocate for putting affordable housing in all the districts. Um, and two years ago, we decided to put 30% in and, and nothing really happened. Um, uh, if if it's possible to, in this proposal, I think we need to do like they said and keep a very narrow definition. It needs to be the federal government state's definition of it. Um, and if we're able to do that cost effectively, again, if we could compare it, if we use the money in another area, would, is it cost effective? Then it makes sense because people should be able to work and we need affordable housing distributed. But we need to look at all of our options. The reality, though, is that there's no land in Channel District, right. and uh, we just paid four plus million dollars for a little postage stamp as a park. There's no land for parks. Um, the only land that's available there is the working port, which I, I would heavily defend against developing into something else. Um, we don't. We, even if we got the land, it would be incredibly expensive, 
and, uh, and, and, and land that could be available, all the other developers are salivating. We, don't, we, we have one parcel we might be able to put a fire station just because the developer is, is, is being generous and wants a fire station there, but otherwise there's no land. And so um, uh, we, uh, we moved forward a year or so ago to, to update the plan of the CRA. Uh, the, the reality is we need affordable housing throughout the city. Uh, we have we have parks that are falling apart all over the city, including South Tampa. Uh, we have sidewalks that are that are falling apart. We have potholes. We have um, places all over the city where we can't put um, sidewalks. And uh, you know, I think our sidewalk budget is still around six hundred thousand dollars a year. If we just moved a million dollars out of this uh, CRA and put it into a sidewalk fund, and it's complicated to do that, but if we did it, that would more than double our sidewalk, but which would make kids and families safer throughout our city. And so I, I think it, whatever decisions we make, we shouldn't just make the decision because we happen to have the money there. We have to make the decision about how could we better use this money if it was outside. And because we saw the, 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 the situation of some of like, this is not 30 years ago where, uh, where we had uh, empty where, former warehouse property. We, we have a full redevelopment, robust community, walkable neighborhood, every, it's been a huge success. But, but we, uh, we need to carefully look at how we're spending taxpayer money. And if it makes sense to, to uh, keep it there and we can hit that, that tight definition, fine. But if not, we need to seriously look at moving it into either a parks fund or a sidewalk fund and or a, a for ideally affordable housing fund uh, that we could use in the best places we should throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you. Also, um, we're also working with the uh, Tampa Police Department, uh, and we're doing this in all of the down uh, the urban CRAs, and that is to include uh, SEPTED in, as an element. Uh, as we bring online uh, facade grants and things like that, crime prevention through environmental design, uh, to actually offer grant money, uh, matching grant money to uh, storefront owners and uh, biz uh, building owners to work with the PD to put eyes on the street through cameras and other uses of SEPTED. Um, we are currently working with uh, parks and recreation. Uh, we agree that the, month, the land in Channel Side is, is very rich and we can't move fast enough. Every time we see a piece of property, uh, we're not fast enough to compete with the developers. They, by the time we get to it, it's already under contract and it's usually for a price that we feel that the board would not recommend any, that would accept anyway. So we do have existing property, property that was purchased prior, that does have uh, recreational uses on it. The new plan says green space or open space. And green space is too expensive right now. Open space, on the other hand, can be created. And so we have been working to go vertical in Channel District with our recreation to create more green space. Uh, we have Washington Street Park and it is uh, being, it's already budgeted for planning this year and for construction next year. And we are working with a Dix Height consultant to bring forward a vertical uh, park system that would actually increase the, the square footage of that park, almost double it for a much, much lower price than if we were to purchase land of the same square footage. Uh, we are also working with Parks and Recreation because there's a little bit of uh, apprehension there because this is something new. We have looked and looked and looked over the internet to try and find something similar and we have yet to find it. It's innovative, it's creative, it's exactly what CRAs are supposed to do. The plan, one of the major parts of the plan says to create new green space and open space. We're trying to find you the coolest, best, neatest, creative way to do that at the best price. So that's why we're bringing this forward. We're going to do some conceptuals and then we will bring that to the board. Also, I can't say enough about uh, Ken Atkins, your city horticulturalist. Uh, we have been looking at enhanced public landscaping and maintenance uh, in channel. And uh, I found in him an excellent partner who can use private vendors and contracts to help us reach that goal. Um, we are in negotiation with him to start in the new budget year. We have money budgeted in this next upcoming budget. And this would be 
uh, landscaping, and then enhanced maintenance above and beyond what the city currently provides. And we'll be able to show that through contracts. So we want to be able to prove to the board that we are taking it above, uh, a step above what, what is currently provided throughout, throughout the city. Central Park in Tampa just Heights. one moment, um, board member Carlson. Sorry, just one more thing, and, and, and this is the drumbeat I've been making for three and a half years, and I'm sure my colleagues are uh, maybe tired of hearing it and, and, and maybe know this, but um, along that quarter from the aquarium on around the bend, um, there, were, there are three uh, cruise terminals, uh, maybe about to be one more, and there's a huge ship repair company. Um, together, those represent at least a couple thousand high-paying jobs. Uh, when you look at that land, um, several times over the last 23 years, development communities looked at it and said, oh, we could just develop that as condos. Well, once a condo is built, there are no more high-paying jobs. Where are the high-paying jobs on a condo building? They, they, the, all the money come, comes up for And so if you, look at, if you look at the city as the business of the, if you look at the business of the city as being to get property taxes, then that's maybe better than what it is right now because some of the, the, most of the land is owned by the port. But if you look at it as how do we solve the problem of our economy being in balance, why is it that we need 50,000 affordable homes? Because people aren't earning enough. Well, you take more than 1,000 jobs where people are making $80,000 plus and you get rid of them to build condos, then we need 1,000 more affordable homes. So we please, as you're looking at the, everybody, as you're looking at that land, um, think about it's not, it's, it, it can't be about what's shiny and bright and new, what looks pretty. Um, it, it, sometimes when people move near the port, they say, oh, if we could just get rid of that ugly stuff. Well, that's thousands and thousands of jobs, not including the economic impact of it. And mm -hmm. think about 50 or 100 years in the future. Tampa is, is, has been slow compared to our other ports in Florida, but it is going to take off in the next few years um, because the other ports are crowded out. We, the thing that we have that other ports don't have is land. And if we make the mistake 10 or 20 years ago, they said, we need to do like Baltimore and build the Inner Harbor and all. That's how the Channel District was first built, and it failed. Um, Har uh, Inner Harbor has failed. If we give up that land and build condos there, we'll never be able to get those jobs back, and then we're going to have a distribution problem. All of Central Florida relies on our port. Uh, Orlando gets its oil and gas from us. Um, we need to absolutely protect those areas. Uh, to make sure that we keep those jobs. We, it, we, and we need to look at this as an economic system. We have to get more high paying jobs, not fewer. And if we get more high paying jobs, we need fewer affordable houses. Thank you. Yes, and I will agree. I just took a port tour last week and it was amazing, the economic driver that it is. So thank you. We go back to the next to the slides. Central Park, which is one of the smaller CRAs in the urban area. Uh, again, the first two are underway, working with the other CRAs. Uh, the CAC has recommended uh, to budget for um, the purchase of the Paradise Baptist Church and stabilization. Uh, that's in the budget. We have been in discussion with the family that has that church. Nothing has come of it to the point that we need to move to uh, real estate, and that budget would need to be approved by the board prior to us really doing anything, but just wanted you to be aware of that. That plan strongly urges the CRA to uh, protect and encourage the Central Avenue history. And that church is one of the largest few remaining buildings that still exist in that area. And, um, and it, is, uh, it houses a huge uh, collection of memorabilia and, and different types of artifacts from the area, plus a lot more. Board Member Meniscalco. I'm really happy to see this, having toured it. Council Member uh, Goods was there as well. Uh, Pastor Williams has been coming here forever. Um, what he, you know, this, the historic significance of that building, you already said it. With what Central Avenue was, that entire district, we have a handful of buildings that exist. And we can't properly uh, teach and share the history of that area because it doesn't exist. It's like demolishing Ybor City. So I'm glad to see this there, and you're right, the collection that is housed, uh, I don't wanna say downstairs, but the, the bottom level is something that I think everybody needs to see, maybe in conjunction with the um, History Center, because it's just like, you know, certain events in history we say never forget. This is something, especially with the Civil Rights Movement and all the changes in the Jim Crow era, 
what's there is when you see it, you don't believe it. And when you learn about it, you don't want to forget it. And we shouldn't. So history doesn't repeat itself. And we see, you know, how things used to be. Um, and also how make sure we never go back to anything like that. But uh, I'm glad to see that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, so that will be, once we move forward with that, it'll go through real estate and go through the proper purchasing uh, for the, for the, that the city uses, and it's, it's also there. I hope to be able to report something, you know, in, in the near future on, on that movement. Um, this area is also working on, oh, this is Tampa Heights also, I, I combined them. But we're also working on a um, roundabout that was, uh, the CAC approved uh, or recommended the approval of an amount of money uh, for the roundabout on, uh, on um, over by the Pearl, and the, uh, it will come to the board, and we'll also be working with um, public art and uh, culture. And then finally, uh, we are working with, uh, St uh, not Stetson University, but we're working on a crosswalk between Stetson University parking lot and the Waterworks Park on the curve. Uh, came to find out that mobility was interested also, as well as FDOT. So we hope to be bringing you back something on that, and we have money budgeted in this next year's budget for the planning of that. It will also include some sidewalks on the Stetson side and probably some stormwater because we'll be putting in some impervious surfaces. So uh, we have money set aside over the next two years to do that project and it wouldn't probably be some kind of lighted system since it is on that curve and that could be a very dangerous situation. So those are the four urban uh, CRAs at this time. I just might want to add that um, we would like everybody to attend the, the Florida Redevelopment Association. This year I begged and I begged and we got Richard Rothstein as one of the speakers. He wrote The, uh, the Color of uh, Money or color, color of Law and he'll be speaking at one of our sessions. So uh, very well known um, and respected author. Thank you. All right. Up next is Jesus Nino with West Tampa and Drew Park updates. Good morning. Good morning. If we, if we can get the presentation up. As far as West Tampa, there's a lot going on in West Tampa, many, many projects, but I try to keep it brief here. We just concluded last week phase six of our cleanups for the alleyways uh, on the southwest portion of the CRA. And we're about to release at the end of this month an RFP to go out there and clean up all the alleys all at once. Uh, the reason why we had it in phases is we had to figure out what was what, what was vacated, what was in use, and, and so forth. So. This RFQ will go out there and just clean them up. CAC is probably going to recommend that we do it four times a year, just as a courtesy to the residents. We'll try to educate them on their role and responsibilities to keep those alleyways maintained. As far as, um, let's see, we also hired a full-time clean team that started this week for Main Street. So they're out there cleaning up. I've been out there talking with them, talking to the new company making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and not missing any areas. But it is a learning process for them up front. But once they get the hang of it, all the little nooks and crannies, then they're good to go. It seems like I'm missing a slide, but I take responsibility for not making sure it's not, it wasn't put in there, but it's okay. Uh, basically we have, um, we did a request for proposal for Ray Park and Sassine. So we we're expecting to get those back pretty within this month. They're for design build uh, for the parks. We decided not to go the design bid build process. We just felt that it would work better for us to just have a designer work directly with a contractor to get a design and get it built. Um, and as far as a October 9th, we have the West Tampa Historical and Cultural Event, which is strictly for the CRA. CRA is putting it together and it's for us to give out our information to the community on our projects, our programs, and other city services. So it's not an outside organization. It's us putting it together for the community. That's West Tampa. Any questions? Board Member Goods. You know, uh, I went to a function, a back-to-school function, uh, and 
I know West Ham in the back of my hand, but I did not know about that park yet. Hey, so why don't you tell the board about that park back there and what the church over there is doing? Fremont Linear Park is a park right in the center of West Tampa. It's um, It's been there for a while. It's actually streets that were closed off back over a decade ago by police and fire and the city in general. But uh, Revived Church put together an event on the weekend, I think last weekend, at Fremont Linear Park. I had Parks and Rec go out there and clean it up. But it, and we mobilized very quickly and put together a booth and we were there, that's where I saw it. Mr. Councilman, uh, board member Goods, but I thought it was a spectacular event. Community came out in force and just enjoyed themselves, and it's a jewel right there in the middle of West Tampa. We actually have concept des designs for it, but that's after South Scenes and Ray Park. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. For Drew Park, uh, we had a very successful public listening session last night at Hillsborough Community College for uh, the improvements that we're going to make to Tampa Bay Linear Park and a new potential neighborhood park um, on Hubert Avenue. So it, it was very well attended from the community. Usually we struggle to have quorums, but this wasn't a CAC meeting, it was a public meeting. So very interactive with the landscape architects, the community, business owners, and um, I think it's going to move forward very very well. We have a second meeting scheduled for August the 30th at Hillsborough Community College and we're hoping that if you want to attend, you can attend. And individuals that are involved in West and Drew Park that you know of, let them know about the event. Uh, we're working with Placemakers Design Studios and the City's Landscape um, Architects on this, these projects. As far as other projects we have going on in Drew Park, we did hire a consultant, Una, um, Una Landscape Architecture to look at Lois Avenue and Grady Avenue to kind of give us an audit on what's worked and what hasn't worked in the past and then after that then we'll go out there and bid it out to fix up those streets and make them safer and more aesthetically pleasing and she's also going to concentrate on the roundabout on Tampa Bay Boulevard and Lois to maybe put some kind of public art piece there. That concludes Drew Park. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Courtney Orr, Ybor City Development Manager. So the fiscal year 23 special events co-sponsorship grant program that supports local nonprofits celebrating the arts and culture of Ybor received 26 applications, and the seven-member review committee looked at those, scored them, evaluated them, and in the end awarded, or is recommending the awarding of uh, 23 of those uh, applications funding. And we will be seeking approval for those next Tuesday at the CAC meeting. The CAC chairman, Steve Barbas, requested each of the committees, subcommittees, to review their top priorities and reaffirm what they selected as the community priorities from our Vision 2020 plan. And so um, you can see listed there that the community preservation and sustainability, economic growth and mobility, and thirdly, the public safety and district operations agreed on the worthwhile community priorities listed there. The top two photos on this slide are uh, capturing the Casa Marti project under construction at 7th Avenue and Nucio Parkway. This development will include 127 residential units and 9,000 square feet of commercial space and the anticipated completion of it is later in 2023. WSP, the consultant selected to work on the 7th Avenue bricking cost feasibility study recently was issued a notice to proceed and so an internal kickoff meeting with mobility and Ebor CRA staff will take place later next month. And we are very pleased to have officer, TPD officer Brandon Kane as our new Ebor business liaison officer that's patrolling Ebor Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So he's um, a great presence on 7th Avenue and around the district. And he uh, pops into our office regularly for updates. So that's great communication between CRA staff and, and police. 
And then lastly, when you have a chance, please check out the first WEDU PBS short form episode on Greater Ebor. This episode is highlighting the famous Cuban sandwich, and it can be viewed at wedu.org slash greater. It's also on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. So they'll be rolling out some more short form episodes that we look forward to seeing. And thank you. That concludes my report. Board Member Maniscalco. Uh, I see here the consultant has started work on the 7th Avenue bricking cost feasibility study. Very good. I was, I was thinking about that while in Ebor last night about how beautiful the street, 7th mm -hmm. Avenue, would look with the bricks and restoring that to what it used to look like pre 1960s. So I'm glad to see that there. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good morning, Cedric McCray, East Tampa CRA manager. Thank you. Okay. Um, first, I'd like to highlight that um, the East Tampa CAC approved Dr. Sonia Brookins to fill a vacancy that was. Uh, opened up in June uh, 2022 by Mita Martinez. Um, Dr. Brookins was uh, listed as a candidate for and was on the slate for election, the upcoming election that will be taking place on September 13th. But um, she was approved by the CAC and the East Tampa Partnership at their meeting last week. So uh, she will be rolling off of the, uh, the slate of candidates. Next, uh, I'd like to highlight the uh, approval of the CAC for $8,500 in working in concert with Parks and Recreation for a Kaboom Build at Williams Park. Um, really excited about that opportunity. Uh, thank you again to the CRA Board for last month approving the Emergency Roof Repair Program. Um, with me, I have brought a yard sign that's not a campaign sign. I know we're getting close to that season. Many of you probably know about that, but um, this will be posted at each residence that receives the services. Um, we have a orientation meeting that will be taking place with all interested contractors or vendors for the uh, roofing program, and that will be on Wednesday, August 31st at 6 p.m. at Reagan Park. And uh, from that time, we will start. We have uh, several homes that have already gone through the review process and title search and the like and uh, we're, we're looking forward to moving forward uh, sometime after the 1st of September and um, the applications will also roll out the uh, second week of September for the uh, program but we're getting calls daily and uh, residents are really excited about about that uh, upcoming program. Um, next I uh, just wanted to let everyone know also that uh, we have been having conversations with uh, Tampa Electric Company as it relates to some of the polls, um, as you go through some of the thoroughfares on 22nd, Lake, 34th, um, some of them need to be repainted and touched up. I know that we're coming to the end of our uh, contractual obligation as it relates to the relationship. So we're looking at either painting or upgrading the polls at some point, um, just waiting for them to get back with us on cost and style styles, and, styles, and then we will share that with our uh, East Tampa CAC at some point, and we also would like to have the opportunity to place banners as we're talking about uh, branding East Tampa, you know, having something similar to the logo that was on the um, sign would, I think, go a long way as, as people are coming into the uh, intersections that are crossing uh, 21st, 34th, 22nd, MLK, and Hillsboro on the uh, city operated roads. Okay. Next. Um, had a lot of conversation over the over recent months as it relates to the owner occupied rehab uh, program and I know that you all had some brief discussion last Tuesday or this past Tuesday on the program uh, the committee has had an opportunity to review the application or application that um, that were submitted and uh, they are now looking to uh, make a decision on what the next steps will be whether it, um, we will re-advertise um, they were not uh, pleased with the um, the, the one applicant that was approved through the process and um, we will have to 
either move forward with updating the, S the uh, RFP and uh, re-advertising, or there, may there were some conversations about um, conducting and running the program in-house, which would um, you know, also be discussed, but um, hopefully we'll have more to report back um, at the uh, September meeting. East Tampa Pre-Development Program Workshop was held on the 26th of July and a lot of robust discussion and uh, we'll be touching on that later so I'll, I'll yield from uh, going too deep into that conversation. Uh, the East Tampa Strategic Action, Action Plan was supplied to all East Tampa CAC members as well as the members of the CRA board. Hopefully you received them uh, in your box or um, in, they were delivered in hand and um, on August 2nd, the East Tampa CAC, or I'm sorry, uh, yes, last week, voted to unanimously move forward. I'm sorry, no, not unanimously, it's a six to two vote to uh, approve and move forward with the approval of the uh, strategic action plan for East Tampa. And uh, you have a presentation that will be coming up here later this morning as well. We did have a conclusion of the East Tampa Summer Youth Program and uh, on it, you see a picture. Um, we did have a capstone event, and that was done in partnership with Habitat for Humanity, where these youth that were working this summer, um, I think it was two days before they wrapped up the program at the end of, end of July, uh, built planter boxes. Those planter boxes will be placed at uh, properties in East Tampa that Habitat for Humanity will be doing work on uh, throughout the summer and the remainder of the year. And um, so they were able to uh, design and uh, paint exactly how they wanted them to. It was uh, amazing to see because some of the young men and women had, had not held a drill um, and, you could, and, it, and it showed. So uh, I think it was good uh, training for them and uh, also to do some good and kind of get out of the monotony of what they had been doing either uh, you know, throughout East Tampa and Parks and Recreation facilities. Um, we are having some ongoing public art discussions as it relates to murals in East Tampa. Um, the Aesthetics and Beautification Committee has uh, been trying to identify various sites. Um, we do have funding that will be coming and been allocated in our FY23 budget and uh, look forward to continuing those discussions. Um, next, I would like to mention Penny Saver. And uh, on the previous side, I'll go back. Uh, I was our environmental detective, Curtis Williams, shared that picture with me uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, you may have received notice that uh, the demolition will be taking place on August 24th at 10.30 a.m. So I'm, I'm imagining it will probably be a groundswell of participation from residents in East Tampa. I'm sure Ma Bell is listening and she will be there as well and with her hard hat on and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing that come into fruition as we move forward on that project. Um, last but not least, I would like to take a point of personal privilege to uh, thank Ms. Eva Hughes. Uh, Ms. Hughes has been working in the East Tampa CRA office for nine and a half, maybe ten years. Um, she will be transitioning to a new department in the city, um, but she, in my returning back to the city of Tampa, Ms. Hughes has been a, a wealth of knowledge and support, historical information and data that I've, I've requested, just not being here or in the in the midst of the CRA um, previously and I just wanted to publicly say thank you for all her time effort and service to the residents of East Tampa and the East Tampa CRA so thank you Ms. Hughes. Board Member Goods. Well, I know Ms. Hughes a long time and we, we thank you for her service to the East Tampa residents because you know it, it is hard I know it's been a long road <laughs> so uh, but again uh, thank you for what she has done for the folks and residents over there. I uh, want to uh, thank you. I've received a call from some residents and uh, one of your board members of the job you did this week of going out to a, a house that had a situation out there and taking care of that. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Copeland yeah. personally called me. Okay. <laughs> you know, she likes something, she gonna call you. When she don't like, she gonna call you. Mm -hmm. So uh, she called me right away to say, uh, Councilman, you, you make sure that you say something good, but I said you did a good job out there. <laughs> so I want to let her know that I'm keeping my word to what I said I was going to do. So. As, as we stroll down your list of items, you know, uh, East Tampa is on the move. We, we finally got the train moving at the station a little bit, you know. I'm happy about that. The residents are happy about that. They're excited. They see some things moving. Um, you, I, Like I tell everybody, East Tampa now... The, the board is now having knowledgeable people of the subject matter 
on the on the on the CAC board now. So now they, they question things, but as before, people didn't question. They said, well, okay, whatever the city said, and it went along, we didn't get things done. But now people are questioning because now you have people who have experience in these areas. You have Dr. Brookings on there now, who she's the conservative uh, board or something like that. Now, so she knows about the environment and other things like that. The Kaboom Project, you know, each staff has always got a Kaboom Project about each year. Williams Park will be the one that's coming up, and I did ask the administration to look at uh, some type of, uh, I can remember from uh, the young lady, uh, four-year-old Sunny Bell, be put on that Kaboom project. Uh, to talk about gun violence and kids can see and understand what happened and get a mindset of parents who are taking their kids to the park. But uh, I, we should get a follow-up on that in a couple of weeks in reference to that request. I think that's a great project. I want to make sure uh, to get the exact date, uh, Cedric, so I can be out there and be able to help out and build the project. I'd help build the one on Osborne and 30th so I'd like to be a part of that project again. Yes, it's uh, tentatively scheduled for a date in October. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, but you get that to me, I want to be a, be a part of that. Your roof repair program, you know, I've, I've finally seen that coming to move. Thank you, Mr. Elise, for that. Uh, it, that's something that's needed in East Tampa. You see all the blue rooftops. So it, there should be nobody uh, driving a police car, a fire truck, a, a code enforcement, a city employee that see a rooftop that should not be writing that tag, that writing that address down, getting it to you all of us so we can know and go out there and, and be able to help those residents. Uh, I think it's a beautiful thing and, 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 and I think people are gonna appreciate that. Um, we talked about the polls. I see you went and got, it, and got that working with Tico. You know, I, I wanted to do it for Christmas and have some things, you know, get, get a different vibe, get the atmosphere different looking, people be more involved and engaged. So I'm happy that you did follow up on it and, and get that done. You can go to the next slide for me, please. Disappointing in the occupied rehab. I thought we should have been way, way, but a long time coming, and now we at a standstill again. I'm just hoping, Mr. Drumgo, that you we, we we can kick that in the gear. I think that's that's very important because if you can kill that blight, you can bring on new joy. If you're able to help some families without stringent criteria to help that outside, that inside, that house stays there and it doesn't become vacant doesn't become a drug hole, it doesn't become a, a place of just destruction. So we gotta get that moving. I think that's critical. That's critical for the each part of town and for this whole city because there is housing stock. And these kind of programs here will help, but a lot of times the criteria hinders people from being able to get the help or we just they just don't know about the help. So I'm hoping we can get that jump started quick. I know we gotta put our RFP or maybe in-house, but we got to get that moving. That's very critical. Um, I'm glad we got the retreat going. That, that's very, 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 I can't say that will help people understand how the CAC is supposed to work, how the subcommittee is supposed to work, and that we won't have this turnover or we won't have this flip-flopping every year to where you, you're training every year. I'm hoping the bylaws are going to change that a little bit too because it's crucial to have continuity. And they haven't had that in a while. When I get into that pre-development, of course, I want to ask Mr. Drumble and Ms. Hewitt about that pre-development, but that's crucial. When I talk about, you see that those buildings that I've been talking about forever are in there that are all along the corridors that we, the city should already been approaching these people to see how we can get those back into circulation. Two of those big buildings could be used for apartments. Could be used for a lot of different things. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to see, and I, I got some details on that. I'll get into the strategic action plan. Um, I'm a little disappointed with that a little bit, but we got to move on. Um, the summer program, normally I go, the beginning I go and I meet the young people in the summer program. I didn't get a chance to do that this year. I don't know why, but as long as I'm the council member of the district, I want to make sure that I'm there to meet and greet them. And at the end, uh, don't have it on a Thursday to where at the end of the program. I mean, yeah. I, I just, I, that's a pivotal point for me and whoever's the district five person sitting in that seat to meet the young people who are out there working to be able to give them inspiration, motivation, understand the three C's and what they need to do. Uh, but again, good presentation. A lot of things are moving. We're alive in five. We just got to make sure we keep the coal burning in the train. Yes. Thank you. And uh, as it relates to the summer youth presentation, I believe it was initially scheduled for Tuesday. I wasn't able to make it either because we were here on that Thursday. So, but um, we'll definitely keep that in mind. And have my hard hit for Penny City. <laughs> yes, I'm sir. I'm going to knock that down. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Yes, sir. All right. Um, so item number seven on the agenda, uh, the board requested Administrator Travis uh, here along with uh, Manager McCray to provide a report regarding amending the CR, the East Tampa CRA plan and suggestions for uh, improving the governance uh, within that uh, particular CAC. So I'll take, uh, I'll take those slides, thank you. Yeah. There's your motion. And uh, just for background, the, the CRA has a formal board policy uh, regarding the organization and operation of the respective CACs. And so currently, only East Tampa and Ebor CRAs have representative community organizations, with East Tampa being the only CO CAC without ex officio membership. Uh, for East Tampa, that organization is the East Tampa Community Revitalization Partnership. Okay, and that is a broad-based group of civic and neighborhood associations, institutions, and residents that uh, have interest in East Tampa overall. The current structure uh, of that particular CAC is a total of 13 members. Uh, four of those, it, it's four residents minimum, one for-profit, one business owner, one not-for-profit representative, uh, one property owner, and then the rest are at large. Uh, and so you know, I think this has come before you as a, as a board several times over the past two years. And so I wanted to provide you with a couple of options on how to really address the governance. Um, and so this, this final slide here really breaks down those three options. And uh, the first option is really for the board to revise its policy on CACs. And so with that revision, you can request that the, the partnership amend its bylaws that aligns with uh, something that is more amenable to, the I would say, the rest of the CAC so that they all have a consistent and similar structure. So that's your first option. Uh, your second option would be to uh, update the redevelopment plan. And so with that update, you know, the, the way it's currently structured, the CRP is tethered to your CAC. And so uh, what, what that update could do is basically go in and attack the, that governance structure and make sure that those two entities uh, come out separate and standalone entities from one another. Uh, and then the third is uh, really for the CRP to revise its own bylaws, which it can do with two-thirds member votes. Um, and, and of course, that would probably be uh, the, the most challenging in, in getting the CRP to do that solely on its own. But uh, I just wanted to provide you with those three options. And, and from a staff recommendation standpoint, I can tell you that the, the best way to probably go about it is to update the redevelopment plan and then make a change in government, a governance, one of those key features that you would like to see as an outcome. And, and you could do that and make that recommendation. Um, your CAC has already voted to update the redevelopment plan, even though we just had a, an SAP uh, update that, that is before you today. But I think that that, uh, that redevelopment plan update and focusing on the change in governance or the governing structure uh, could be a, a more favorable outcome because then the, the consultant can work with the groups talk it through and figure out something that's amenable to, uh, to the membership and to the CAC, and to the community, really, to make sure that the representation is sufficient. And then I'll just stop and I'll stand for any questions. Um, yes, Board Member Goose. I like option two. Uh, the person who actually has sat on that board <laughs> and had to understand the difference between the, <laughs> the partnership and the board it's totally confusing. It's totally confusing. People don't understand their roles or what lane they need to be in. Then you have the subcommittees. It's, it's total chaos. I'm, I'm sorry, it's somebody, I hope I don't offend anybody out there, but it's chaotic at times. You got new people coming in all the time and nobody knows what is the chain of command or assume what the chain of command is. It's very difficult. I've been to several meetings and they're getting better, but you know, just the mere fact of the bickering, it's a lot of that because you, it, it, it's, it's really confusing to everybody. And I, I think for me, I, I would put a motion to actually look to get them to update the plan. Uh, I think that's needed. Uh, <laughs> we all agree it's chaotic. I hate to say that way, but we got good people there, but I think with you, with, 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 
updating the plan and having the retreat would be able to get it all in line. And with your bylaws, get, get everything in line to where it's going to be able to be more functional versus dysfunctional. And have people happy about coming to the meetings versus not at the meetings. And then I'm going to be candid also the voting process at those meetings. Uh, people coming late or well, people leaving early but votes can be taken. Now you don't have a quorum to vote on items. That's a challenge. Well, you something's not voted upon, well, well, what one person likes it now, you still got items to vote on, but other people have left the meeting, now you can't vote. I mean, it's factual. It's, it's factual. I've been there, I've seen it. I've sat on boards where that's happened. Uh, I think the update is good, and, and, and also incorporating your treat in there to, to, to get a better functioning board. Uh, Ms. Tate's doing a good job. Uh, the other uh, Chair folks have done it a good job as well who, who've been the chairs, but you've got all the other forces that just they have to fight with and it's going here, there with no standards. So I, and I think it'll help the manager a little bit better as well. Uh, so uh, I, I, the motion's on the floor. I think Mr. Carl's second already, correct? <laughs> so, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, board Member Carlson. Yeah. Um, I agree with everything he just said. I, you know, over the years, I've been asked by several people in the community to either uh, sit in or listen to these com these meetings, and they were very confusing. And um, I think staff was confused, and to some extent, staff didn't didn't give them the resources they needed either. And we, I think, have fixed that. That's why we had so many people come out and complain. Uh, but we had similar issues in Ebor, and it's it, it, there's there's the the confusion um, in the structure, there's confusion about who's in charge. There's also the confusion about brand. And in Ebor, we've mostly moved the brand over. Um, I wish we could figure out um, what to do with the other brand so there's no lingering confusion. I think we should sunset it and 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 put the $20,000 a year into um, the chamber, somebody to administer that, that the, the, the placards. But anyway, um, People want to know what the CRA is spending money on, and if we say ETCRP, people don't know what that is, and and we need to go out and explain that, like the signs we saw a minute ago. I don't think they say CRA big enough on them, but we need to explain to people this is this is where your CRA money is going. This is how we're spending it. Um, the other bigger thing, though, is the election process and the appointment of um, of board members. Uh, massive confusion, ma massive uh, disagreement in the community. The way it has been in the past, as I understand it, is anybody who's attended a board a meeting in the past can is eligible to vote, but then there's been confusion about who owns the list, who qualifies, who can vote, and then there's campaigning in the community, and there are these factions that fight each other. We saw them all come together, by the way, to, to complain about how the CRA uh, was working with them. but. Um, but we need to end that. We need to bring the community together instead. And I think we, uh, in, in whatever we do, and maybe that's number one instead of number two, but we need to, we need to resolve the problem about how people are picked for the board. Um, and, and it shouldn't result in division in the community. It should somehow bring people together. Um, and it should be clearly stated that the problem with the way the structure is right now is that um, uh, the, in, the, in the past, the staff members were assisting, but they weren't in charge of the process. And so we all got blamed for the process, even though we technically legally had nothing to do with it. And so I really would like to clean up that process as part of this as well. Thank you. Um, board member Citro, then. I, I, I just need to put in my two cents. Uh, coming from my background with the CRA in Ybor City uh, to Take The Rock, we all know the wrestler The Rock, his famous line, know your role. I, no offense to anyone in any CRA, but if you don't know what your role is, how can you complete your role? How can you add your, your wisdom, your knowledge? Uh, I, I go to several CRA meetings. I've been to West Tampa meetings. I've been to East Tampa meetings. I've, there needs to be some sort of, of identification on what your role is, whether it's a committee member, whether it's a board member, what times you're expected to be there, how you vote. Uh, 
again, it, it's just from my background with a CRA that I worked with for almost eight years. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, uh, Board Member Vieira. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, just for the um, public, I just got here. I, I got on the interstate on I-75 at about 7.55 or 8 a.m., and I just got here. There was a very, very traffic double fatality to Piers about 200 feet ahead of me. And so I was on the interstate stuck for like two and a half hours. Never had that happen. But so just to explain my absence. Thank you. So we have a motion um, made by uh, council member. I'm sorry, board member. Can you repeat the motion? The motion would be please? to go with option number two along with the retreat and bylaws uh, to be added in the update. And that was seconded by board member Carlson. Uh, roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? And, and I'm so sorry, I just got in. What, what are, can, can we, what's? We're on item number seven. We're talking okay, so we're just approving? For the restructuring. We're choosing yeah. option. Which, which option? Yeah. Update the community redevelopment. They, staff presented three options mm -hmm. for the board to consider about how to consider the potential governance issues and the possible restructuring of how the East Campus CAC is structured. And so what the current motion that's before the board mm -hmm. is option number, uh, yeah. option number two to review and come up with suggestions on how to revise the governance issues through the, the update and the rewrite of the community redevelopment plan for the East Tampa CRA, which is within their budget okay. for I'll, next year. So that's, I mean, I'll, I'll trust the maker. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. May, may I say one Board thing, member, Madam Chair? Yes. I, this is not unique. I, I believe all the CRAs are structured <coughs> the same way. Am I correct? Uh, to some degree. I mean, you have people that want to attend, that want to be board members, that get voted in or out. We don't make that choice. No, um, this, let me, let me, just so you all understand, the, the, we're not we're talking about the CACs, the, uh, mm -hmm. the the advisory committees for each of the CRA areas. Um, of your eight CR, CRAs, CAC CACs that have, you've established by policy, the slate actually comes before you all to approve. Right. Except for there are two exceptions. The two exceptions are East Tampa and Ebor. Um, the CAC for EBOR is the board of directors of the YCDC, and that's the confusion that uh, uh, board member Carlson talking about. Corporation. And then the uh, the CAC for East Tampa is the board of directors for the East Tampa Partnership Partner Revitalization Partnership, and so they are they are selected differently. Now you do have to give final your final blessing to their slate of candidates and their board members, but it, it's not something that formally comes before you. And the, and the other CACs have designated spots, ex officio, ex officio spots for each neighborhood group or major organization that has an interest within that area. But so. at the end, we still approve those no matter which area you're in. Yes, sir. So it's the same thing, in a way. In a way. It, it, I, I just, <laughs> the board has never uh, not approved you know, the I election by the, the YCC, YCDC board or by the East Tampa uh, folks in, in connection with their... Let me ask another question, for me, Madam Chair. Un under what I've heard, I've been silent for a while just listening. Is there anything on, on, the, on, the, on the record that if you miss so many votes, you're out or something like that? I don't know. They're so, all different. They're all the same. They are different, um, board member. And I'll tell you that East Tampa, they do have some <laughs> provisions in there for missing meetings, but I will say that it is very scarce. Um, currently, in order to vote in the elections, uh, the, the partnership members only need to attend two meetings. And I know that there was some discussion at the last CAC meeting to tweak that, and there was some pretty, I would call it assertive, uh, you know, the, the, the folks didn't want to have to attend more meetings, despite the fact that they, they have 93 opportunities to attend the meetings. Um, they only have to attend two of those in order to be able to vote it's in crazy. the election to choose the CAC members. <laughs> 93 well, meetings, uh, subcommittee, man. regular meetings. Man, how do you meetings. solve that without changing the process? Yes, we don't. Yeah. I think that's what we're talking yeah. about. I think, I think <laughs> the concept is that, that, that we're going to ask the consultant through the update of the, C <coughs> the, the community redevelopment plan to come up with suggestions how that process should be changed. 
But if we change the process and you have the same people, what changes? Okay. Well, okay. I, I think that <clears throat> I think what happens in this case is that okay, the other CACs, um, somebody nominates them and then we approve them and they go Correct. on. And so we have direct control. What happens here is that members of the community, they don't have to sit on the board. They can just be members of the community. They go to two meetings and then they are eligible to vote. So the community votes everybody in and then we're given – and, the, and we, the reason why we would never undo that is because we wouldn't want to go against the community, but there's all kinds of factions and, and disagreement because of that process. And I think everybody in the community would like us to clean it up uh, so that there's no more um, arguing. Okay. Uh, board Member Gibbs. Mr. Mr. Jungle, uh, I, I heard about it. Mr. McCray, I, I heard about that. Uh, and I didn't know how many meetings there were, but I'm gonna tell you, to have 93 meetings a year and only attend two, that's unacceptable. You don't know what the heck's going on to be able to vote going to two meetings. You don't, you just come in, you're going to vote because somebody takes the votes away and you have no idea of the work that's been put in and you're voting a certain way. That's absolutely crazy to me. And I'm going to tell you, that's something you don't need to change in that. I, I just won't tolerate that. 93 meetings and you only attend two and you can vote to change whatever, whatever. Uh, something, something that's been on the table from a year previous to make things. That's a problem. That have been making things roadblocks. Got a problem with that. That's got to change. We've got to have some continuity of people who are, who are actually invested in the, in the board, invested in the projects, not just I want to be on there because I want my way or I'm not getting this project done or what they're, what they're not doing. you got to have people invested in it. They've got to be some commitment. This commitment here, if you miss any means here, eventually somebody's going to say they don't need to be on this board anymore. So I want some commitment with that. Yes. We have two people who attend these meetings regularly or sit in the back. Is it possible we could get them to each give us a 30 second feedback on whether they agree or disagree? If you would want that, you need to waive your rules to allow them to speak at this point in time. Uh, well, second. Okay. But we are in the middle of a vote. Yeah, yeah. Right, you're right. Um, do you want to finish the vote and then listen, or do we want to stop the vote? Whatever you decide, Madam Chair. So, um, you want to stop the vote and then we'll. Yeah, I, I think we should probably stop the vote. Um, and can we do that and re vote? Just I, withdraw. You just tape or you could table the motion until you've heard Let's, from okay, the table. individual. Uh, okay, so um, I have a. I have, uh, yeah, I have a motion to table by uh, Board Member Goods and a second by Board Member Citro. Um, if anyone wants to make that motion to waive. Uh, second. Okay. Uh, we have a motion made by Board Member Goods to waive the rules, and a second, I believe, by Board Member Vieira. If they'd like to speak, by the way. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. We have a motion. We need to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's, let's we'll make a vote ahead. on that. Yes. I apologize. I'll vote yes. I'll vote. I'm sorry. Yes, we need to make a. We need to vote on the first one. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And the second one, all in favor? Aye. Still good morning, Allison Hewitt. Uh, um, I sit on the Evaluation and Planning Committee when uh, Chairman Tate became chair. She put uh, Clint Paris, another CAC member, as chairman of the CAC. We have been going through the bylaws <clears throat> pretty much a disaster. If you have folks who don't attend the meeting uh, as CAC members, the only recourse you have is to be able to send a letter saying, please attend the meeting. So it's no warning is no able to remove um, the, the, uh, the person who may or people may who keep you from doing a quorum. So we have been spending a lot of time going over these uh, the bylaws and one of our main challenges of that is as you have been discussing is continuity. And so when you are trying to have the discussions about projects and you don't have attendance or you have folks who say, well, we're not gonna talk about this project until after the election in September because we're gonna have potentially six new people. Um, and so then you have to wait for a presentation that was gonna come in June and then we'll say, okay, we're not gonna do anything until after the election because we have a whole group of people, new folks that we've gotta to have to educate about the process or the project. So I will, I will say that the Evaluation and Planning Committee um, is really looking forward to um, working with staff on changing it um, because there are inconsistencies between the partnership bylaws and the CAC bylaws. 
the CAC goes to meetings and don't, don't have a clear understanding on which bylaws actually govern the projects that they're talking about. There's a misunderstanding on who gets to vote at a partnership meeting and how you vote at the partnership meeting. And so we have this well of interest and these more people attending meetings, but as more people are attending meetings, they're getting frustrated because the rules, the roles, the understanding is um, unclear. So we are looking forward to as a member of evaluation and planning and of those 93 meetings, I probably go to 80 of them a year. And so I uh, definitely agree we had a very energetic discussion at the committee because the committee actually said eight meetings and then um, at the CAC um, went down to six and then down to four um, because they, they just don't, don't know what you're going to be doing and you can't attend the meetings but we have some real world issues that we're dealing with and we would like people who are able to participate and vote and more than two meetings is not going to give you enough information on who is active who's bringing the information, who's made the presentations, who was investing, you know, and quite honestly, we've got contractors who are not taking care of uh, their people houses that, you know, were contracted through the city to do work. So, you know, if you're not participating, if you're not listening to the meetings, then you can come in to the two meetings and someone says to you, well, you know, you've been to two meetings, we need you to vote on this. I mean, they're not making it based on to see all the work that people are putting in. And we have a group of folks who are there coming to committee meetings, signing on. That's one thing I will say, if I can put a, a shameless plug, if we can also put in our budget to invest in some technology, because we do have a lot of seniors who participate, but they are not comfortable coming to the meetings. And so we have a hard time with the teams or or whatever to be for them to be able to hear so we will have even more participation once we invest in technology for our seniors because as you know in East Tampa we have a significant senior population but thank God they're very active so that's my 30 second probably a little bit more spiel <laughs> as a participant in the East Tampa CAC Good morning again. I'm Keela McCaskill and I'll sit on the subcommittee for membership and outreach and I support the revisions as many of them as possible because it is somewhat confusing. It to me is downright embarrassing to have, you know, you all come to the meeting and half of them not there so you don't have a quorum, you can't do anything or people come in and it's very confusing as we work hard to draw more people to have interest. We want to see that the, the people that's representing is also vested and they are participating, engaged, and, and knowledgeable at the same time. So I would like to see more than two. Uh, you have to attend two meetings to, to, in order to vote. I like to see that the revisions. And, and then one thing, maybe this is not the place, but I'll mention it. I think one of the reasons we're probably losing such a key uh, staff member in. Um, the East Tampa CAC is because they're overworked. When I, when I heard 93 meetings, I didn't think about it because I'm probably at 90. Um, but I, I didn't think about the staff being present at every single meeting. 93 subcommittee meetings and they're required to make the revision right along with the rest of this, that maybe they don't have to be there. Maybe that technology that she just mentioned, if it's there and the meeting is recorded, we don't need the staff there. They have children, they have lives. This is not what they, they didn't sign up for 93 meetings. I know they have a job to do, but I think that's a bit excessive. So if we could make that revision while we're doing that, if that's possible, we don't need staff present at all 93 subcommittee meetings as we make, you know, whatever changes. I don't even know if we need to have 93 a month or whatever, you know, as many meetings. Maybe we need to cut that in half, but something to, to kind of work with the community as well, but also the staff, because they are people, they're not robots. So I just like to see that revision. So I support the change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, yes, I, Board Member Miranda. Thank you, Madam Chair. That 92 meetings, if you take out the vacation time and holidays, that's two meetings a week. And not only that, then you break up two different, you have sometimes three or four meetings a week. So I don't see how anyone that wants to participate can attend 92 meetings. It's impossible to have a family and, and look around what's going on in your neighborhood and attend 92 meetings. Especially when you're volunteering and trying to do the best for your community that you, that you want to do, make it come up. And, and so forth, I think success has been our failure. So would you like to revive your motion? Mm -hmm. oh, 
Yeah. Man, along with the bylaws uh, and along with that retreat for a clear understanding of uh, the, the, the organization. Second. Second. Okay. Yes. Um, board Member Goods made a motion and Board Member Carlson seconded. Roll call vote, please. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Cedro? Yes. Miranda? Yes, 92 times. <laughs> Goods? Yes. And her attack? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Can I ask? Yes, Just Board Member Carlson. Staff, since we went through this long discussion about East Tampa, and East Tampa is different. Should we make a similar motion for Ebor just to clean that up so that they're all, all eight are consistent? Because if we fix this one, then Ebor will be the only outlier. So I would say that we would like to have the discussion with the CAC first, if that if okay. that is the desire. That way, they can at least be able to weigh in on that. Just similar the way East Tampa, you know, uh, CAC has weighed in on this matter. Do we need need to make a motion? Or you just want to do it? Uh, we'll go back and do okay. that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right. Um, item number eight uh, on the agenda uh, at our June meeting, I believe that the board asked for a report on available lands in East Tampa CRA, and this was more geared towards affordable housing. Um, I know that uh, the public, some folks have asked for this list as well, and so I submitted a, a copy of this list for the record. It's an updated uh, memo uh, with a breakdown of the available land, and you all have a copy, and then also I submitted a copy for the clerk as well for the record. but. Um, I won't be long-winded with this. It is a pretty extensive list, and so rather than just give you the properties that are listed in uh, the CRA and then and also in East Tampa, I broke this down uh, in a, a couple of ways for you. So your first table, um, and, I, and I don't have it for the Elmo because it's several sheets of paper, um, but uh, the first uh, page here that you see, it's a list of approximately 23 lots that are actually, they're tied with some type of CRA funding. and so. You all can look at that breakdown uh, of those lots. Uh, there are effectively, you want to look at your far right column, which shows you if any additional action is needed on that property to determine whether or not it's buildable. I wanted to give you a, an idea of what you can actually go out and develop right now without any additional environmental zoning action or any just any other questions about the suitability of that property for development right away. Um, and so when you look at the breakdown of that table, 23 total properties, nine of those properties with a no next to them means that there's no additional action needed. Those properties are ready to go for immediate development. Um, and then your second table are properties that are not funded by the CRA, but uh, they also have, uh, excuse me, the, the list shows you what uh, properties may need additional action so all those say that say no you see one through 27 there so there are 27 lots that don't require an additional action those properties are properties that are within the cra but have no cra funding tied to them okay and the final table that you see are those properties that are within the cra but they also require additional action and uh, to determine the feasibility buildability of those parcels uh, and I, I see the the board board member with his hand up. <laughs> okay. You know what I'm board looking at. Board member Goots. You know what I'm looking at. The the bulk are in East Tampa. You know what I'm looking. I mean, it's a failure on our part. We have this many properties, and the CRA has been in how long in existence in East Tampa? We should have bought all these properties. They should be in circulation. I'm sorry, you know, and I'm not putting the blame on past or whatever, what, but, but this is the future now. We, we can't let this go. This got to get in circulation. This is a lot of properties, man. I look at 22nd Street. I mean, this is all in the deep core. The deep core. That, that some of these properties probably be rehabbed, maybe need to, to be demoed. I mean, can be thrown back, may have code violation, you know, tell them, but need to be in circulation. These are a lot of properties. And I think the, the CRA board needs to be looking at this and seeing dollars put to either buy, looking at if these people got cold body, how we can help, whatever we need to do. But this is a lot, these are a lot of properties. Are all these properties so, owned by the city? Okay, they're all, these are all under our control. They all sold city owned properties. These are all city owned properties. All under right. control. Okay, so now if they're out of control and East Tampa CRA has money, they've been holding all this money for this many years, 
We should have been dealing with real estate to deal with the city portion or whatever to see how we can get these back into circulation. So I still say it's still unacceptable. And we got to move on this. This is a lot of properties. Right. Bo board member Carlson? No. No. Well, well yeah, I, yeah. I want to make well, sure that you got, I don't care if he goes first or I go first. Yes, he was asking, so. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I mean, we asked, this board asked for this a couple of two or three weeks ago, and this is a result of what we asked for. And I, I'm just looking at it, and uh, I, I'm glad that the CRA, uh, the city, not the CRA, has control of some of these properties to, to build on. Some of these properties are, the lots are not according to our zoning code, however, there's some lots like 18 and 19 that are right next to each other. You can make that into one and yes. you have a, a buildable yeah. lot. And, and in some cases, even a smaller lot, you can still build a house for a one bedroom yes. and some a two bedroom and still meet the qualifications to have a, a home. And, and these are the things that we need. We are in dire need of, of getting this thing started. And even some of these lots were 4,000 square foot or whatever, depending on the, on the picture, it can't be two inches wide and, three miles long uh, for the size of the lot. But I mean, those that have uh, something comparable where you can have at least a setback requirement, we can build on. And because uh, we need housing, it's not uh, something for tomorrow. But thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Board Member Car Carlson. Um, you said all the properties on this list are controlled by the city. Even though the CRA paid for them, they're controlled by the city now. That they're all under the city's control. <coughs> that is correct. So one thing, uh, Board Member Goods, maybe one thing we could do or you could suggest is that we ask the city and then we can do something on the other side but ask the city to put these immediately into the land trust and and put them out for bid for 99 year leases um, I would um, uh, some if if they're developable if they're if they're existing homes then we would we would maybe want to renovate them and put them back out on the market maybe the CRA could help with that but if they're developable for more than one unit um, we need to make sure that there's a broadly advertised RFP that the, that the city probably would handle then. Uh, but what's happened in the past is that, uh, you know, some RFPs, not, not in this administration, but some RFPs were only seen by a couple people and there were only, I think I mentioned three and a half years ago when we first started, there was a bid for three, there was an RFP for three empty lots in East Tampa uh, uh, to give them away for free and there was only one bidder. And when I asked other people like Habitat and CDC, they said we didn't even know about it. And then there are national uh, developers, private developers of affordable housing that would that would love to come in if they if they knew what the opportunities are and they could bring resources that we don't have. So we need to make sure that they're fully advertised. I like the idea of the land trust with a 99 year lease, and at some point in the future somebody else could extend them, uh, but that way we still have control and it would make it easier for us to uh, easier for them because they wouldn't have to get as big of a mortgage to pay for it, um, and then. And, and then I don't know, Morris, if, um, or maybe you know from the FPRA, if CRAs ever have a land trust, but if, the, if, the, if for some reason the city can't move fast enough, uh, we could look into setting up a CRA land trust and then buy, buy properties even from the city and then put them in land trust and put them out for a 99-year lease. I think Mr. Drumgo is looking at the, the potential of a community land trust either city or CRA or both. Correct. I think that he's looking at setting that up and getting that moving as a potential vehicle. I will tell you, you know, whether we sell or lease or if we convey any property interest, regardless of whether CRA money was involved with the property or it's city-owned property within a CRA, we are required by state law to advertise a request for proposal. But what's happened in the past, yeah. is, and not this administration, but what would happen is they had advertised it in some small ad somewhere, so they met the legal requirement. But then other developers didn't know it. That's how much, how so much property for years was sold under market, um, and 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 developers of all sizes would get angry and say, "Why is it that we didn't even know about this?" And so we need to make sure that it doesn't just meet the basic re legal requirement that we really promote it. And we need, uh, you know, we 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 can't just put it on some state list or national list or advertise it in some obscure place. And we should get a larger list of affordable home developers. Uh, to include the nonprofits here, the for profits, and and others nationally that could potentially come in, we need to bring every resource we possibly can. But here's a resource we're sitting on that could help subsidize um, the building more housing fast. But we, the city and the CRA, can't possibly build all these quickly. So we need to partner with uh, partners outside to get it done. Thank you, um, Board Member Citro. Thank you very much, Councilwoman, uh, Madam Chair. 
to Councilman Goode's point, we need more housing. To Councilman Miranda's point, some of these lot sizes are, are a different size that would not be able to fit within our um, buildable lot size. Let's just say in, in Drew Park, there's one 7,200 square feet. Mm -hmm. How can we as a CRA board talk to permitting or talk to uh, uh, people so that we can take that 7,200 square feet and put two smaller houses on it so we get more for our bang or our quad. quad just so that we could put more on each. Can you find that out for us and report back to us? Thank um, you. And I want to throw something in before anyone makes motions too. Uh, <clears throat> what I really want is because I'm incredibly visual, I would like a map. I want to see where all these properties are and the, the proximity because as you were saying, there's a ton on 22nd Street. I don't know how many of those are contiguous. And if there's available lots that might connect those so we can do a bit of a larger project. And again, once we put the RFPs out, uh, but until we know exactly what we're looking at. So I would love to see um, a map that <clears throat> maybe with the zoning on each little square and then uh, what else? So I'd, I'd want zoning and then just to see, yeah, uh, what maybe maybe um, a color nearby about some properties that are that are vacant or that are oh actually that's what I wanted I wanted to know the difference between the the properties these properties is the, is there a building on them or are they vacant so those are those are the those are the two things I want to know the zoning for each one and whether the, maybe there could be two colors one for vacant one for you know has a building on it um, but that's what I would like to see. I, so, I don't think I can make a motion. If I, no, he'll, he'll down. Yeah. If I, if I may, I, I, I am taking notes. I just, I, I'd like to just add in there, you know, I know that our housing team has done a phenomenal job issuing the RFPs for the infill program. And it sounds like you have some immediacy relative to getting some of the CRA properties out for, uh, you know, for that. And um, I do know that they will be putting together and issuing that RFP here within the coming months. So if you'd like, we can also take those properties that don't require any additional action. We can report back to you and let you know what, what type of density that we can probably get out of these parcels, but then also uh, let you know, um, that, like, hey, if you'd like to, we can move forward and put those in the pot, and they will go out to a multitude of developers, uh, similar to the last round. Um, and then the other thing uh, that we're looking at, uh, I think when you talk about the land trust, you know, we're, I'm working to, to try to stand that up relatively quickly. Uh, and, you know, putting those properties out now would be a little bit premature uh, if, you, if your intent is to establish, you know, the land trust, if we, if we have the land trust. So just, just thinking about, you know, the timing of it all, we can, we can certainly go forward with some of these properties, but I think those properties that also require some additional background and, uh, and research, uh, maybe those are the ones you want to hold in consideration for the trust. But then also those properties that are within the CRA, and owned or held by the city that don't have CRA funding tied to them, uh, perhaps a, a way for us to accelerate the development of those is to come back with a plan for you as well to say how do we maximize densities on the, density on those parcels and then also uh, to tether some CRA funding to those to push that uh, development and make it more attainable for the price point that uh, I think we all want to see. Um, Board Member Carlson. <clears throat> yes. Um, Board member Goods or whomever made this original motion, um, you might want to tonight, as we're sitting as city council, ask for a monthly update on this list to update the properties and also the status with them, because it's really the city, the CRA can support it, but because it's the city, but that way we can track it for the public, and uh, and also for ourselves. But one other thing is, I I would suggest, and I won't make a motion, but I would suggest you add other properties that could be converted to housing. Sure. An example is, um, I uh, uh, the chief of staff put together a whole team. We were looking at um, Tampa Union Station, and I've also met with the friends of Tampa Union Station. Behind Tampa Union Station, there's a huge piece of property. Part of it is parking, but there's also a building back there that is um, that is not a historic building, and uh, that that land could be part of a 99 years for a redevelopment for one of the big developers out here. You could put several hundred units in there, 
And so my point is that there is other city-owned property that we potentially could put into a land trust uh, to build units faster. A lot of these are going to be one, two, maybe quads. But if, if there's a place where we could build several hundred and, uh, you know, in that case, add to and help support a historic structure, uh, historic uh, facility, it, we should look at those spaces as well. There might be some older uh, kind of derelict buildings out there that, that the city owns that could be converted to lofts or some other kind of housing as well. If, and, and my suggestion is that we put it into the land trust because that'll make it more affordable for everyone. It'll be part of our subsidy and then somebody 99 years from now will either be able to release it or, um, or use it for something else. Thank you. Um, well, you know, board member, I talked about that land trust and made that motion back in 2019. Uh, we, and uh, we finally had a workshop on it because CRAs can have a land trust. Uh, they can do it as a nonprofit and have somebody operate and run it. Uh, I'm glad you're working on that now. I think that is crucial to what we're trying to do now. Uh, I just get upset when I look at what could have been and we, we haven't done it. Uh, I think now that the crisis is here, we got to do what we got to do now. But to do and make it move now, you've got to put a team together. It's got to be a separate team. Your housing department can still work, but you got to you got to put a team together to aggressively go and make things happen right now. Uh, and I hope with the dollars that we're going to be able to uh, hopefully approve for you with CRA and City that we build a team, a separate team. And I said before, East Tampa is the biggest CRA. It should have been divided into quads because if I if I do a little work over here and I jump over here, you don't see it. You don't see it. No difference. Channel is a small area. So you were able to see that growth, see it move. So East Tampa has to be broken up in a quad to say A, B, C, and D, or whatever you want to do it, just like the police department has, a, has we call sectors. You have sector E and sector F. Sector E is should be, they change, it should be 26th Avenue all the way up to Hillsborough Avenue. And the rest goes down, and now you have a, a, a major who runs that, that, that uh, district, but now you have a captain that runs E, you have a captain who runs F, and you have all the, the uh, under, underlinks behind it. I just think you, you've got to have a system to where if you bring in some new people, you have a system to where you have somebody in charge, but there's sectors to get things moving. Uh, I, I think we've, we've talked about this. Uh, I'm hoping you go in that direction because to accelerate what, you, what we, we have here, but I'm just telling you, for this many years, you're telling me we have all these properties, and within the city and the CRA hasn't approached uh, the city, which I think Ms. Gooley did try to do that at one point when she became a CRA. She asked for a list of all properties. But sometimes we, we, we get kind of hesitant on the information we want to give because Mr. Carlson asked for this, this back in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, a reference to all of the properties. And we were just now getting it. Now, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure this is not everything. I'm sure uh, we got other properties in the city, but I, I like to still see what, what we really have as a, as a council board of in, in the city so we can build this team. So I, I know I, I can trust you and Ms. Uh, Travis will, will get it together, but we got to build the team quickly to make it move. Thank you, Madam Watcher. Um, the only other thing I'm going to add to that is that, again, there's so many of these properties on 22nd Street, which I know is a business corridor in some areas. So it would also be really interesting to see how all these come together, because is, is just putting housing there uh, a good use of funds, or should we do some type of mixed use where stores on the bottom, housing above? Um, so I, I think that if we can actually see it and see the um, how it all, uh, how some of these prop properties are close to one another, or they congregate, or how they relate to one another, it will also help us a lot in that. Um, Madam Chair, well, you know, you brought that up. You, you you look at this list and you see the addresses. You see it. Back in 2019, 2018, Ms. Goodley, who was the chair at that time of CAC, begged that those properties, uh, property was, uh, was there, not be built upon with homes because it was the corridor of the district mm -hmm. or build retail with housing on top. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen. It fell off there for you with the city and they built houses and they messed up the intertwining up there at 26th Street back to... Um, 18th Ave, where it comes up, so now you killed it because a grocery store could have been put there. A grocery store could have been put there. 
The numbers are there for a grocery store. We've got to find somebody who's willing or, or maybe help them entice them to come. But the numbers were there. But, you know, and I'm not blaming Domain Homes. But they, they had an opportunity. They built those homes back there. And it really messed up the whole corridor. It really did. Now you come up a little bit to where Miss Miss White's home is, going up towards North 22nd. We'd be buying all of that. And now talking about putting some retail at the bottom and then talking going going up a little bit, with a little density up a little bit, to have a great uh, you know, 22nd Street core. Same thing on uh, 29th. You know, going towards the uh, right about maybe 28th Avenue, Cedric, or 30th, going up to ML King, up to the railroad tax past ML King. We got to be visionary. That's why you got to have a uh, you know, people talking about a, a a a planner. A planner can't can't do that. What you need, you need to have a designer, a developer to come in and develop. Planner can't do that. And I saw that kind of in the budget there, and I'm going to question that too because that doesn't need to be there. That, that name needs to be changed to a developer. Hiring a developer to come in to develop your community, not a planner. So those are my comments, and thank you for bringing that up because we talked about that extensively, and they did it the way they wanted to do it, and look what we have a mess over there. So does anyone want to make a motion about bringing this back at a specific time? How much time do you need, Mr. Drumble? I know it's well, a lot of work. Well, I know it well, is. And I'm looking at it in a, in a combination of tasks, right? What you so we, 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 we break it down in a combination of tasks. And I understand that there's a, there's a request for us to come back with a strategy on the personnel and on the funding of affordable housing and throughout the CRAs. And so I ask that you let us handle that task first. And then uh, can, we'll continue to work on the trust and, and standing up the trust, but then also really understanding, uh, I think, Separate and apart from that, the mapping piece, we need to go back and talk to our team about how to properly map these and, and how to get the coding accurate to make sure that we can strategize on that. And then there, I'm hearing that there's also a long-term plan that you like to hear relative to more acquisitions. And so we wouldn't want to come back and show a list publicly of all the property we would be interested in acquiring because then, you know, that changes the price point on things. But um, I, I think we can put together a, a list Kind of behind the scenes and, and potentially share and discuss you know one-on-one -on, -one on some of the properties that may be prime uh, for acquisition for some additional development uh, but then also i'm hearing uh, with that mapping the analysis of the mix of uses and i do know that you can't in, you can put commercial property into a trust so i don't think there'll be any conflict in having mixed use along a corridor where we have residential and commercial as well um, so um, you know we just ask that get a little bit of time on that we'll come back within the next two weeks or so on the uh, on the structure the staffing piece and then give us a maybe a month or so to report back you know we come well we won't have a meeting in October so if we could come back in November and with the mapping the coding the, to give a presentation on that just provide you with an update and um, also we'll provide you with an update on the uh, on the land trust progress as well uh, councilman since you're you're asking for for that to be a prior prioritization as well so um, and if I missed anything please let me know I think you covered it all. but also the possibility of or potential of a land trust within the CRA if it makes a difference if the, if the CRA can move faster um, than the city then it might make sense to have a separate one so you, I think you'll look at the whole thing and come back and sure. by the way I really like the idea of, of, of shop houses too, having retail underneath and anticipating the density of the future Okay, so then do we, does anyone need to make a motion about that, or are we just going Mr. to? Mr. Drumgo, can we trust you with that? Do I need to make a motion on that, too? It might be helpful to have just a motion on the table that he's going to bring up an update of the map and, and an update on the land trust concepts that would come forward to, at your November CRA meeting. All right, uh, what's the November date, uh, Michelle? November 10th, 9, 30, uh, 9 a.m. I put a motion on the floor at November 10th, Mr. Drummond, will come back for those items listed uh, for that report, reference the we was mapping, land trust. Uh, did I miss one, sir? Renovation of property. Renovation of property. Second. Renovation of the property and acquisition of property. Okay, we have a motion made by board member Goods and seconded by board member Miranda. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Thank you.
Okay. So we continued item number nine. Uh, if, I don't, if I, I may. Yes, board member Vieira. Uh, thank you very much. If, if I may, I continued that because I didn't know if I was going to be here by 2 a.m. tonight, given how traffic was. But um, may I uh, just make a motion on number nine uh, to have that go from, I think we continued it to next month, and then to have um, a, a follow-up uh, to, to rescind that since I'm here, and so we don't clog up the agenda further, um, and to speak on it very briefly. May I? So move. Sorry, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, those, so um, well, we I, oh. need to vote on that. Oh, yeah, quick. yeah, so you're we right. Have a we do. You're right. Uh, made by uh, board member Goods and seconded by board member Citro. All in favor? Uh, uh, thank you yeah. very much, uh, uh, CRA board members and uh, chairwoman. So, just very briefly, I saw the report and, and I appreciate all the hard work in the report. Um, it appears that there's several million dollars that are going to be necessary to get there. I think it's a very, very worthy investment. And from my understanding, you guys, and, and by the way, I appreciate that I brought this up last minute. You got to look at the report. So if you got to do that, you're totally cool. But it's my understanding that you are going to go back to the respective CAC, see what they think about it, and then report back to us. Is that correct? That is accurate. If that's if that's the desire of the board, that's that's what you like to see. We can go back and discuss the potential parking, the the upgrades with those CACs, so that they can prioritize mm -hmm. uh, what improvements or which parks they'd like to see these happen in. I can tell you that the park staff was very, um, you know, it, it, it still has to be planned. Uh, I think you know sure. from a staffing perspective, and so even if they had the full three million dollars to upgrade all the parks. Um, right now, they're on about a 15 to 20 year pace relative to the sure. current uh, allocations to do it. But uh, if we wanted to bring bring down that timeline two to five years or something to that effect, we would need to work with the park staff and through those CACs to, to really prioritize those improvements. And just keep in mind that you're having discussions about affordable housing as well. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about those park upgrades, you know, we, we only have so much money in the budget to be able to sure. move things around. And, and I appreciate that. And again, I don't, and I don't think anyone of this council wants this to be done or, or, or push it immediately. I mean, one, one piece at a time, so to speak. I see that downtown, as I recall, about $600,000, uh, um, you know, and, and a lot of people come to downtown from all parts of the city of Tampa. Yes. I saw $1.6 million for each Tampa. Would love to see that done. Uh, West Tampa, et cetera. So um, let me ask you, if we were to bring this back, let's say in February, do you think that would give you all enough time to speak to the CACs and have a, a good, good, clear picture of where we're at? Or do you all need more time? I do think that's sufficient. Okay, great. So sure. if if I may, I'll, I'll make a, a motion to have this come back. And, and yeah, if anybody. I, I'm sorry, I'm yes. not here to interrupt, but I think we got the, if we put this for September, we got to take that September vote out. And yes. And the motion take president <coughs> the one we had before. I thought we did that. We did. We just reopened it. Yeah, we did. All right. Question. Yes, um, board member Goods. Ms. Drumgo, I, uh, I attended the Florida League of Cities last week, met with several uh, playground uh, people, uh, and uh, a couple caught my eye, especially when we talk about accessibility equipment. I did have a short meeting with uh, Ms. Hills, uh, I want to say late Tuesday afternoon, gave her a pamphlet. Uh, and I was impressed as one company, uh, Mr. Beer would, would, would probably enjoy this, where they had, you know, a lot of our kids uh, or, or adults, uh, accidents happen or they're born with certain uh, disabilities and they have to use wheelchairs. Mm -hmm. And some of the playground equipment was dual equipped for your everyday healthy person and your wheelchair person. I'm talking about the, the lift. Mm -hmm. The lift to get their body strength, leg strength. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So uh, she got a, a presentation I gave her to be looking at. So I'm sure when you follow up that she may mention that and I'll tell her too because sure. I think that's critical in some of our areas and communities that people with disabilities who they can't really enjoy the part because they can't they can't do a monkey ball or they can't do certain things. And I thought uh, that was uh, a neat uh, added attraction to maybe some of my parks. Sure. Thank you, sir. And, and if I may, and thank you for that, Councilman Goods. I know you've always had a heart on this issue, so thank you uh, for that and for your uh, wonderful, constant passion on that. Um, so, so if I may, I would vote or I would motion to have this back to us in February Second. of 2023. Okay. February 9th. Um, yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, motion made by Board Member Vieira, seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And, and if I may, um, it, I, and there are obviously areas that are not CRA. This is putting on council hats. So tonight, 
I'll um, ask the administration to also look at that as well. I wanted to do this under CRA so that we could expedite this as much as possible. Sure. And then for the many other areas, um, and I'll leave that at discretion, including for the different district council members, et cetera, but just for a general motion uh, for that, because that's uh, very, very pivotal. I know New Tampa is getting an, uh, uh, an all-access park as part of the East Tampa uh, recreation improvements. That's also going to be an all-inclusive park, my understanding. So that's uh, wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Item number 10 is the East Tampa Pre-Development Grant Program. We have two levels to that program. Uh, these programs were approved uh, before the East Tampa CAC. Mr. McCray will be presenting these two programs. Good morning or good afternoon at this point. Uh, Cedric McCray, Tampa CRA manager. And if I could have the uh, Elmo on, please. Okay. Um, <coughs> I know that there have been a lot of discussion as it relates to pre-development and um, ultimately the program has been discussed to spur development along our commercial corridors uh, in East Tampa, north and south. Uh, so we're primarily looking and discussing 15th Street, 22nd, 29th, and 34th. And um, this is a part of our uh, community redevelopment plan. Uh, level one, as Mr. Drumgo said, we have two levels. Level one uh, was to design to provide up to $15,000 for applicants. And uh, level two is a grant loan to grant program that is designed to provide up to $300,000 or no more than 15% of the overall project value in reimbursable loan to grant funding. Um, and it would ultimately be a forgivable loan. Eligible services uh, for the $15,000, um, it would the owners would either have to own the property or have produced that they are uh, renting or tenants of that specific property or address. One-on-one um, -on -one consulting would be covered in that, uh, in that amount, preliminary design concepts, sketches, and the like. Also, a development of the scope for a particular project. And um, once they have been able to reach that point and, and produce that information and, and uh, have been reimbursed, then if they so choose, they can go on to level two. Um, and those eligible services would be uh, ultimately schematic design and other basic, basic architectural services, uh, mechanical, plumbing, plumbing engineering, and uh, IT. Um, landscaping and uh, purchase of site control would also be included in that as well and uh, those overall scope of services, um, any renderings or drawings for final revision and uh, construction documents that would be needed for the permitting process and they ultimately would have to be signed and sealed by a registered architect um, or other applicable personnel. The general conditions for level two um, applicants that received the funding, uh, the business pre-development loan to grant program are eligible for for one business pre-development grant per every five year period um, applicants who receive funding must submit a copy of all final work products to which grant funds are applied and uh, these will be you know for public record all projects will display signage um, similar to the sign that i sh showed earlier this morning um, as it relates to that you know the project did receive uh, East Tampa funding from the CRA specifically. And um, applicants also have to agree to be part of uh, publicizing the, the fact that they did benefit from uh, CRA dollars as well. Um, and East Tampa reserves the right to consider exceptions um, to these policies and guidelines on a case-by-case -case discretion. Um, during the subcommittee meetings and uh, workshops, uh, there were several recommendations that came out, and uh, these are just a few of them that we thought were important. Um, it was mentioned to partner with uh, various agencies and nonprofits to assist small business owners or in help building out their ideas. Um, some of the items that may be covered would uh, possibly be able to be conducted and could do a little bit more hand hold holding of their hand uh, through that process. So there, there are some entities uh, that actually do that here in the city of Tampa. 
and um, would welcome having some conversations with them as well. Um, the idea of a first step meeting to manage the work assignment and um, that would be kind of started and conducted by our staff internally and uh, this is just to make sure that all the deliverables that they are requesting have been uh, solidified and uh, before any compensation uh, is approved. Um, there was a recommendation by staff uh, for level one to uh, go up to ten thousand uh, dollars following the workshop discussion we went up to fifteen and uh, for level two it was we started at hundred thousand dollars and it went up to three hundred thousand um, dollars as it relates for the uh, individual product projects for level two uh, they would also the suggestion was made that um, we include a budget and performer when financing plan ultimately the businesses that are going through this plan or program would um, have a packet of information that if they needed to seek additional funding uh, from a lending source, they would have all of that in hand when they went to uh, make that request. And uh, we also did include a rubric or scoring application. Uh, and I think ultimately each organization would, on a 100 point scale, they would have to simply get 60 points uh, to move forward um, and for the next step of approval. Um, board member. Thank you, Madam, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McRae on uh, Yes, sir. Uh, and uh, do we have an idea of basically how many you think are going to be in from that 10 going to 15 and from the 100 going to 30A and the Part D would be under from 10 to 15 is a 50% increase in the amount of money. But when you go to one, it's a 300% increase of money. Can you tell us why? Um, ultimately, the scope of services would be more expensive um, depending on the size of the project. Um, when we looked at the other programs around the state as a staff, uh, you know, we thought that uh, the 10,000 was about right. And then some of the some of the programs that we looked at, they were a little less than 100. We knew that we wanted to do a little bit more. So that's why we moved it up to 100,000. Well, what you just said, they caught my other ear, left ear, that you had some a little over 100. How many did you have over 300? None, none currently. We haven't had any formal conversations or advertise a program, but. I, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not concerned, but it just, uh, the numbers don't match. One going up 50%, the one that you don't have any on going up 300%. Right. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about the 300%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, and that was the recommendation uh, from, from staff. And then we had ongoing conversations, a uh, workshop with the economic development subcommittee. So then they overruled you guys? That it? Uh, not not exactly. Well, um, I understand a vote we, is a vote. No, we we we, <laughs> we agreed. Um, we it was uh it was a few sticking points that uh, came up, and um you know ultimately we would you know yield to the uh, CRA board for understanding. Well, I understand, but I don't understand. Yes, sir. If I may, I just want to support what Mr. McCray is saying. Um, you know, we did. We had some extensive conversations about the various programs. We looked both in-state at best practices from other CRAs, and we looked at out-of-state programs. And so I think, you know, he, he omitted some of the nuts and bolts of our process uh, and, and, and a little bit of the back and forth. And so, you know, in the closed-door session with staff, we looked at the numbers. Uh, we wanted to go for some lower thresholds. I mean, this is a risk. And so without, you know, we wouldn't be forthcoming and doing our jobs if we didn't tell you that we were, that it is a risk. And there's a chance that some of these projects will go forward. There's a chance that some of them won't. Um, but at the end of the day, looking at today's current market values and the scale of projects that need to occur in East Tampa um, and, and the support that those projects would need, um, you know, we, we thought that we, we probably needed to move alongside with the, uh, with the recommendation from the CAC. They wanted the $300,000 in there, but he is correct. At the end of the day, you are the board and you can, you can recommend a lower threshold or you can go with the recommendation from the CAC. Also keep in mind that we can pilot this for a year. You know, we don't have to keep these numbers exactly where they are. Uh, we can start at a certain number and, and, and adjust up or down depending on the number of applications that we get. Currently, I think the recommendation is $600,000 to kick off this program, with, which would encompass both the level one and level two. And we would hope to see uh, a lot of participation that doesn't exceed or max out the $300,000. May I continue one yes. more? So then you're telling us that the total amount of money you have here is 600000 
for the fiscal year. That for is the fiscal accurate. year. So yes, if sir. you have two, 300,000, you got no more money. That is accurate. Oh, muchacha mia. I don't like it that so much. <laughs> Board Thank member you. Gates. Well, I was looking at that too, because I'm looking at, <clears throat> and I'm going to ask Ms. Hewitt, that's why I asked Ms. Stacey, she'd come up. I know she helped kind of work with staff a little bit on this project, which is good that we have outside people that can work with staff and, and get things moving. And I'm happy that you come up, Ms. Hewitt. And when I look at some of the land projects here, some of these are monumental places. Uh, I look at Jackson Store, which is 3402. They, they have a lot of property over there. Uh, I mean, a lot of property over there, uh, where, where that store is and behind it. Uh, you know, I look at Nebraska and, uh, and Lake, 3705. I mean, that could be a huge development uh, process. Uh, some of the projects I'm, I'm looking at it could, could be a game changer in East Tampa and take a lot of blight away. Uh, and I just want to thank Ms. Hewitt for uh, hearing what I've been saying and, and made most of the staff. And I guess she uh, went, went back to her committee and, and got to work on this. So I just want to thank her for the, the efforts to work with staff to move this. So I just want to get some of your thoughts on some of these projects you're talking about and, and the threshold Mr. Miranda was talking about. Um, thank you, uh, Allison Hewitt. Uh, thank you, Councilman Goods. Um, yes, we have uh, been working on this on over a year now. <clears throat> and the initial request from the Economic Development Committee was 300000 and that was based on the Florida Housing Finance has a pre-development program that is in Florida statute that outlines eligible uses of tax dollars to be able to help um, do the pre-development soft costs for um, development opportunities. And what is needed, especially for those potential projects that you have in front of you, is um, a very strong soft cost budget that will allow them to have a development plan that they can, because these folks will not have just on their own the money to develop this. So they're gonna to need to have a plan that they can take to investors, they can take to banks, and, and, and again, this will also require, because we are in the district that we are, a layering of financing. New market tax credits, opportunity zones, brownfields, and so to be able to have someone to be able to help them go through that process, to be able to have someone to pay those soft costs and I will say, <clears throat> these people have been paying their taxes for longer than we've had a CRA. And so they have invested already in the money, in this pot of money that we're going to be um, asking that you consider that we use. And so if one of the things that came out of the workshop is um, DMS at myflorida.com, they have a free guide to calculate A&E services, architectural and engineering. So I did share that my concern with 15,000 for the phase one may be a challenge, um, just to be able to get you to the phase two to be able to do the schematic drawings. <clears throat> we cannot continue in East Tampa to try to have to go to get the discounted rates because you're not gonna fund a gas works for them trying to get discounted rates to be able to bring you the information that they need to know to be able to build a gas works to be able to build the things that they're building over in South Tampa. So I do have a challenge. That's why in my public comments, I ask for flexibility in this because uh, the schematic drawings and everything that you need to get you to phase two, I have a concern that you won't get to phase two because you won't be able to get what you need, well, the, the potential uh, projects for $15,000. But if we do and we get to the 300, to be able to actually put together a development plan that has a pro forma so that these folks who own the property will know how much they need to charge per square foot for the commercial and how, many, how much they need to charge and how much they need to keep rented for their housing. So these folks have had these businesses for like a combined 90 years. So they are committed to this area. They are gonna stay in the area. They live in the area already and so as much as they say it's a risk, I would respectfully disagree because these, this is where these people lived and have raised family for generations. And they want to be a better partner in the development of East Tampa. And so 
if you have a strong development plan at the end of that phase two, because example, the Jacksons, right next door to where we're gonna knock down and do the community center. When you are, especially what the, they want to do senior living there. So you have section 202 that they can uh, apply for for HUD to be able to fund that. And then when HUD sees, when you apply for that, you are more competitive when they see one, you have a significant senior population, but two, you are now right, snor right next door to the services and the senior center to be able to fund that product. Unfortunately, or fortunately with this program and with the access to the uh, technical assistance, we're gonna be able to walk these property owners through this process so that once they have a plan and once they're financed, they also have a management plan to maintain it at the level that we would like to see it in East Tampa. So I think that we may have some challenges with the 15,000. I'm, I'm not quite sure that we can get all the schematic designs that we need for that price to be able to move it forward. But we will be, that's what we were able to get through with staff. But I think the phase two, as long as we're able to make sure that we can create a development plan and a financing plan for these projects, you will see those projects come fruition. I've had the privilege to meet with each one of those property owners and their families, their brothers, their sisters, their moms. One of them is 80 years old and she runs the family with the iron glove. And she says, I would like to see this before I'm not here anymore. But well, they, these folks are putting their money aside. They are fixing their credit. And so they are doing what they need to do to become bankable as well. Board member Goods. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> nothing's, nothing's no greater than a try. I think it can start as a pilot um, because I know all these properties here and they're just rotting. Uh, we have to do something. And a lot of times, we get, I get called sometimes when folks come here, especially from other communities, they don't have the big time lawyers that can come here and know the zoning rules and regulations and how to say this and how to say that. Uh, they get lost in the shuffle and then they don't get their projects done or they say, I, I, I hear all this stuff, but I don't know how to do all that. So they don't get it done. So I think board members, it's, it's, a, it's a craft to say, how can we help those people who, who, who don't know to know and get them some help to move forward. We won't be able to do everything, but if we can get them over the hump a little bit, I think that'll be good to where if they have an architect or they have somebody who can do the zoning, who can do the plans, I think that is just a, a, a great incentive to, to get some blight out of East Tampa. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, um, this city and, and the county, but the city has spent a lot of money on economic development, hundreds of millions of dollars over the years, subsidizing big companies, big developers. Some of them didn't even ask for it, and they, you know, prior administrations just gave them money. Um, and um, uh, I think the community over the years thought that money could be much better spent. Well, we know from the numbers that that all of that money failed. Uh, it made a few people richer, but it, it hurt the community by shrinking the middle class and making uh, the numbers of people in poverty higher and increasing disparities. What we need is real economic development. I think this kind of program is real economic development. It's helping people in the community. Um, you have the bios described in it. That it's helping real people in the community uh, to invest in properties in the community. Um, when we started, there was a lot of money being banked in the, um, in the East Tampa uh, district and it looked like last administration was trying to land bank money for massive gentrification. Instead of spending money on a big project, um, uh, some big project with one big developer who's not from East Tampa, I'd much rather see the money spent in smaller buckets to help uh, families uh, to build uh, wealth and multi-generational equity uh, instead, of, instead of subsidizing somebody from outside just to kick everybody out. Um, so I'm very in favor of this. My only question, and sorry if I missed this earlier, for staff is, um, is there some kind of uh, um, uh, restriction that like if, if they, if they sell within 10 years that they have to pay us back? Um, yes. Because we wouldn't want somebody just to flip it and, and, and then we can keep the fund going. If they make $100,000 a profit after doing this and they, then they can afford to pay our $15,000 back, right? Correct. So um, the, thank you, that's a great uh, question. And I'd love to reiterate a couple things. Um, Ultimately, the CRA board would review and approve any of the uh, the level two applications before they're able to receive funding. 
Um, and as I stated earlier, it's a loan to grant program. And uh, so for 20 years, uh, I'm sorry, not 20 years, 20% for every five years. So over five year period, every 20% would be forgiven. So if, if the possibility of them, if they close their doors after two years, then um, they would be responsible for paying back the remainder. And the same thing dollars. if they sell? Correct, if yes. They, if they sell, then they have to pay, okay. Correct, yes. And the, uh, the $15,000 for level one is you know, ultimately for schematics and we wanna make sure that the, before the projects move on that they are actually viable because you'll have a ton of folks that will be you know, seeking funding to assist them through those, that process but we wanna make sure that you know, they're, they're able to sustain and move on to that, uh, that second level. No, yes. uh, in my Board opinion, no one's trying to stymie development. The problem is that when you look at the numbers, 50% versus 300%, that's number one. I'm just looking at it that way. And then you look at the amount of money. You don't have 60 million available. You got, what, 600,000 available. So it could in 10th be two projects, and that's the end of it. And the little one, the little person who wants to do something with the 15,000, he's out of, he or she's out of luck. I'm trying to look at the whole picture of it. A and B, no one that has 2.7 acres, and I don't know these people, I'm sure they're great, wonderful people. No one that has that can't go and get their own financing at a bank, including the big developers. The big developers and the little developers are all the same, because sometime and somewhere, somebody started small. Nobody started building a thousand unit apartments, a complex somewhere until you had the funds and the capability of handling it. So what I'm saying, I just wanna be ultra fine that that 600,000 is not taken so that the little guy with 15,000 doesn't get anything. That's what I'm looking at now. And how many 15,000 do you get into 300,000? A lot, that's all I'm saying. So you're gonna cut out somebody that could do much more because you don't have the funds to fund the little one. You're gonna take it all if you have, this is one, so you only got one more left and your, your whole budget is gone. And that's what I'm looking at. I say we move and approve it, but as a one-year pilot program. Isn't that what was mentioned earlier, that it could be treated as a pilot program for the, the next year? Correct? That is accurate. You can treat it as a pilot program. Okay. Do we have a second? Here. Okay. So we have a motion um, made by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Member Vieira. Um, uh, roll call vote. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Citro. Yes. Miranda. No. <coughs> Goods. I have a question. The dollar amount you came up, 600, how did y'all round up for that 600,000? I'm just curious because I'm looking, look at Mr. Miranda saying, uh, maybe that should have been a little bit more. I mean, I'm just. You're accurate, Councilman. That is in conjunction with your CAC, developing the budget for the fiscal cycle. So they determined that $600,000 and created that pot of monies specifically for this purpose should we develop the program. So we, we went out and developed the program to, to pair with the funding available or made available. I, I used to think for a program like this to start out, you should have had at least a million dollars for a program like that. If you're talking about four probably, or Mr. Rand said some smaller properties, this should, be, this should have been a million dollar program. Sure, and we can always come back before you and reallocate funding. I mean, we reprogram uh, right. funds as well. So. You could do a budget amendment later on this yeah. fiscal year if there were if you wanted to expand the program and it was that sure. successful. I'm going to put that on the record. I'm looking at this and I, see, I understand why you would know because you're underfunded, but we haven't started and it's a pilot, Mr. Mr. Maniscalco said. So if it starts to, to take off, then all by means you, I want you to come back because I think some of these properties here would be a real wow, especially that, that one at Nebraska and Lake. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I'm going to vote yes on it. Hertak? Yes. Motion carried with Miranda voting no. Um, I want to uh, make a motion, actually, uh, that, they, that you come back in six months with an update just to let us know how it's going. That way we can find out if the 600000 is um, adequate. 
Motion from Chairwoman Hertak, second from uh, Board Member Goods. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's all right. That's six month report uh, regarding the status of the uh, pilot program. I can't do the math. Um, so uh, just a point before we go any further. It is almost 1230. Uh, how does everyone feel? We have quite a few more things, although I think some of them could, we could approve pretty quickly. Uh, what, are, what are folks' thoughts? I say, I say we go through. I don't see any, anything <laughs> controversial. We've discussed okay. so much, so it should be all right. Okay, then, uh, then we're going to aim for 1245. Right. Uh, the next item up is the uh, East Tampa slate of candidates being uh, set forth for approval. Mr. McCray has that. Good afternoon again. Um, you all should have received uh, a spreadsheet. We, we had uh, 12 applicants that were approved by the East Tampa ad hoc committee. Um, one of them, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Sonia Brookins, Brookins was appointed uh, last month to uh, fill a vacant seat. So now we have 11 candidates um, that were listed in total, and I believe five of those candidates were all uh, members that are currently serving on the East Tampa CAC that are seeking re reappointment or election. <coughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry, if, uh, board if member I, Citra. Going back to what we had asked earlier, are they all aware of the obligations that they have by taking on this position? Yes, and um, with the, the process of establishing the retreat that we'll be having on uh, September 30th and October 1st, we will begin to let them know and remind them that, um, you know, what the level of involvement is and is required to of us their serve roles. and be fully active on the uh, East Tampa CAC. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Move to approve. Second. Okay, motion made by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Ma Member Citro. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Do I need to do roll call for that? No, no, no. Okay, it is required. Okay, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, interrupt me when I'm doing something. Goose? So roll call, yes. please. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And her attack? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Okay. All right. The next item up is a grant is a grant uh, grant request for the Wellness Hub, which is a renovation project in East Tampa. Mr. McCray will give you uh, just some background on that project. The CAC did approve this project for funding. We would have to come back to you with a funding agreement uh, after your approval today. Okay. Uh, the Wellness Hub is a a pharmacy. Um, they are looking to. Uh, purchase, or well not purchase, they already own it, to uh, rehab a nightclub establishment on 40th Street. Uh, currently, it goes by the name of 1828. Um, had some ongoing conversations in recent, in recent months, and uh, they have come with a uh, request to the uh, East Tampa Economic Development Committee, and it was approved last month by the, by the uh, East Tampa CAC to fund up to $300,000. I think their initial request was 350. Um, but ultimately, they will be a full service pharmacy in East Tampa on 40th Street. Um, there will be focuses on pediatric and medical services, uh, in-house <coughs> insurance specialists. And um, also, they have a delivery service as it relates to um, pharmaceuticals. And um, it's a husband and wife owned, uh, Dr. Wright. Is, is the uh, primary person that made the request from, and that they also are residents and uh, have, have owned the current business on 50th Street, which is right outside of the CRA boundaries, and now would like to bring it a little closer in to uh, be able to take advantage of some of the benefits that we have as it relates to the East Tampa CRA and the funding. Move to approve. Oh, I think we had a couple of questions first. Um, board member. I think it's a wonderful idea. You know, Miss Regina will be happy with that. That's right behind that, that residential community. Um, yes, sir. Uh, the only question I have is, uh, just like with the Strass, we gave money away, uh, a grant, we're going to get us the amount of money. What, what, what are we receiving? Are we, uh, uh, how are we benefiting as well? Well, we're, we're actually, the, uh, that location, Councilman Goods, or Board Member Goods, um, as you know, has a history. And um, 
there have been, you know, several complaints about the noise, about some of the uh, activity that, that has gone on in years past. Um, now I believe it's only currently open for uh, smaller special events during the day, and uh, that was supposed to have phased out, um, I believe, at the end of this month. So now they're looking, you know, to convert that, that location into a full-service pharmacy. The only thing I ask, just like we do with the Strads, that, you know, with this type of money is that, you know, in their publication, something that the, the East Tampa CAC was a contributing factor to help to move so the community can know that we used to give away some money to some folks that they're helping to build the community. We have a lot of seniors over there as well. The pharmacy could be close. You know, our place is close by there as well. So I think it's a good, uh, a good avenue, but you want to make sure that people know that we help contribute to help get this thing moving. Yes, sir. I, I will tell you that um, we've had some controversial conversations when there have been requests made. Uh, I, this was uh, unanimous across the board as it relates to the subcommittee and the, uh, and the CAC. So everyone felt uh, very positive, and they did, they did an excellent presentation. People know in their readings that, hey, the partnership and the CAC helped provide this sub service. Yes, sir. Uh, board member C. Madam Chair, Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I met this this doctor uh, who owns the pharmacy several years ago with Candy Lowe's Black Business Bus Tour. She is very bright. She's helping the community, and I think in this new uh, uh, location, she's going to be able to provide much more to the community. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, board member Carlson. Yeah, and just like on the last one, um, I, I think this is the kind of economic development we should be doing. It's the kind of thing I was asking for three or four years ago. Um, we should be helping people in the community. We should be bringing assets and resources to the community, making the community more livable, um, instead of funding gentrification and outside people to come tear down everything. Um, and it sounds like you're, they're replacing a use that's not popular with one that will be popular. My only question and, and for the public is, do you, what protections do you have in the contract? Is there like a five-year earnout period like on the other one? Are there any other protections if they change the use of it? Uh, they can't just take the money and they convert it back to a nightclub. I, right? I would defer to Mr. Massey because we're, he we're would going to have to bring the funding agreement. agreement before this is finalized that, that spells out how that will be protected. And so those are things that will have to be considered. They, they're just asking for your general authorization or uh -huh. moving forward with the grant concept, but there will have to be an agreement that spells out all these terms and conditions. Uh, and so if they do convert it back, frankly, there will probably be a, a there will be a payback provision. Yeah, what I, w just as you're writing de novo contracts, I would suggest that we go at least 10 years uh, because we want some protections in with the community. And then also, uh, it should include a change of use also. Um, it doesn't have to be restricted to a pharmacy necessarily, but, but it, that it, it w within whatever tight confines, it can't, be, it can't be converted back to a bar or whatever. Um, and, and the only reason to do that is we, we've seen past uh, not not in East Tampa, but in other places where somebody bought a property because it wasn't advertised properly by the city and then they turned around and flipped it and made millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that we're protecting in every neighborhood and across the board, uh, protecting the community's money here because as my colleague said, it is a lot of money. Thank you. Check. Okay, so we have a move, um, motion to approve by uh, Board Member Menescalco, seconded by Board Member Goods. Roll call. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Yera? Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Goods? Yes. And Hertak? Yes. Unanimous. Mm -hmm. No motion carried unanimously. The next item is uh, it's a reprogramming for Ebor CRA. Uh, for streetscape improvements uh, contract between the city of Tampa uh, CRA and Tampa Contracting Services. Uh, this amendment is a uh, change order for approximately $47,000, which represents a 3.5% increase on that contract. Staff recommends approval. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion made by Board Member Maniscalco, seconded by Board Member Miranda. Roll call. Goods? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Maniscalco? Vieira? Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Hertag? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. All right. The next item on the agenda is the East Tampa Strategic Action Plan. We have a final draft, and a representative from GAI is here. Pete Seckler uh, has a presentation for, uh, for the board. Great. Good afternoon. It's now the afternoon. Um, 
appreciate being here today. Um, we have two documents, um, the actual strategic action plan, and then there's a companion document, and I noted your comment earlier about maps. There's a companion document that's maybe less exciting to look at, but it's the appendix. And this includes all of the public engagement, includes the entire economic and TIF um, analysis, as well as other socioeconomic data for the area. But it also includes um, over 35 maps that we have uh, gathered um, from various sources at the city. It's a little difficult because they're not all in one place. But we now have a freestanding GIS database with um, 40 or 45 data points, including vacant properties, um, all in one consolidated GIS file that is specific to East Tampa that can actually be managed by one of the um, staff members with East Tampa, which is actually pretty exciting. So sometimes this stuff isn't very, uh, you know, uh, exciting to talk about, but it's, um, this, it's actually a, there's a pretty substantial tool here. Um, to your point earlier. Um, how do we bring the slides up? I believe our T&I folks should be able to do that. Oh, there it goes, just like that. Okay, great. Um, all right, so uh, let me just, what I want to do is just take a few minutes and kind of walk you through what's in the plan and kind of how to read the plan. Um, and then maybe a couple of kind of closing comments kind of about the process and, and kind of what the outcomes are. So, so this fundamentally um, is a plan. It's, 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 you know, we started in a place, um, uh, uh, Mr. Goods mentioned earlier, you know, um, lack of, maybe lack of knowledge, some chaos, some difficulties in sort of managing the CRA. And we started this at the beginning of COVID, which kind of doubled down on all of those issues. And, 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 and then we began in a process where the manager actually resigned. And so we really were in a very difficult situation starting this process in terms of community continuity. And the mission of the project at the end, and what I believe the report conveys in the, in the big picture, is that there is a lot of common ground about what the community aspirations are and about what the realistic possibilities are for East Tampa. And the future is bright. And it's time for East Tampa to take pride and ownership in that, which I think is part of what you're talking about, taking ownership of the, of the opportunities and the responsibilities. And also for the outside world, in terms of the general city, um, other entities that are in and around um, uh, the Tampa, the greater Tampa area, that this is the time. This is, so this is about telling a story about the people and places of East Tampa, renewed possibilities. It's about putting some inspirational ideas out there to help people maybe see East Tampa in a new way, in ways that kind of articulate the things that people told us in the field. Um, that drives towards some specific themes and strategies, which I think become kind of the North Star for future opportunities as they come to East Tampa and come to you, you can go to the themes and strategies and say, the decision that's before us today, is it consistent with the spirit of the themes and strategies and sort of the mission statement that's, that's in the uh, themes and strategies? And then finally, I think it's really a call to action. You know, we've said the time for East Tampa is now. Things are on the move. So we're trying to sort of, you know, re-energize not just East Tampa, but also the surrounding community. There's been a lot of attention on these other areas, you know, Tampa Heights, and you know, we, we know all the headlines about all these other areas. Well, now it's time, now it's East Tampa's time, and, and, and everybody should be paying attention um, at all levels. Um, we went through a process um, really starting um, in the, in the um, late fall of um, 2020. We did the bulk of our work through um, 2021 um, and then presenting a, a draft master plan in January of this year, 2022. Um, and then we've been refining and editing and, and, and working with staff, working with the community, um, additional public meetings, additional revisions um, to get to where we are now. Um, you know that it's, it is a large area. This has been mentioned several times. Um, it is the biggest CRA, um, but we went into every single neighborhood and walked the neighborhood with the folks that, um, 
that, that live and work and are raising families and investing in new businesses. So we walked every, you know, every one of these neighborhood areas um, to really try to understand it through the eyes of the people that are there. Um, to see some of the big problems, but also, you know, the broken sidewalks and some of the little issues. And what I would say about this process um, is that, you know, just this morning I've written down some notes, and I'm just going to go through these super fast, but I've heard, I've heard just in the conversation today, which has been a big East Tampa conversation, you know, housing, uh, housing programs, acquisition of you know difficult properties or sort of problem properties in the neighborhood beautification grants marketing the CRA governance of the CRA CRA engagement new housing types um, to get multiple maybe multiple units on certain key lots how we think about corridors having a mapping system um, 15th Street corridor pro uh, property development corridor funding grants small business finance um, assigning the management of work responsibilities, concierge service for small developers that need help, right? Um, an educational retreat session for CAC members. Um, all of these things are all things that really came out of the plan and are now being discussed as, you know, this is the mission. And these were all things that were very much, you know, sort of ill-defined or up in the air or not really discussed. Um, and I think the point about having broad representation, you know, and really thinking about that governance structure, this, these are important ideas. And I think the plan has kind of sussed these issues out and it records them so that they're on paper and you can come back to them in the future. So you understand that there's 10 community themes, um, you know, residential, neighborhood beautification, community health and safety, infrastructure uh, uh, improvements, um, livable streets and transportation, parks circulation or parks and recreation, community commercial services, community based commercial services, um, employment and job creation, um, culture and how we market ourselves, and then ultimately leadership, partnership, and the capacity building of the, of the staff and of the CAC. These are the big themes. I'm not going to go through every single one of them today in detail because we don't have enough time. But it, when you, you know, I'm sure many of you have read the report um, probably in full, but as you read the report, I think the things to sort of be looking for as, as you go through the sections is that, is that we're trying to sort of talk to multiple audiences at different altitudes in the report, both internal to East Tampa as well as external to East Tampa. The executive summary is meant to be an eight-page brief that just puts the big ideas out there, explains that this was a comprehensive community process, and it was a really kind of a, a reset from the ground up for the community, and that there's a linkage between the community input, the themes, the way property was analyzed technically, the way property has been envisioned in terms of possibilities in the upper right, and ultimately how that comes down to where we see your potential TIF revenues going and how you can start to articulate a flexible budget that you can adjust over time based on how things go. And I think piloting things is absolutely a core tenet of this plan. Go, you know, let, let things, you know, give things a chance and see how they go and then adjust. That's what this is about. Um, there's a section about the sort of the background of East Tampa, first of all, as a community um, dating almost back to its origins, not originally being part of the city, which is why some of it doesn't have um, actual um, fixed stormwater and, and urban services. Um, but, but then specifically kind of talking about the movement um, to engage East Tampa as a collected CRA and getting that kind of documented so that we understand that, so that, so that the report makes reference to the original topics of the CRA, which I think are still very much in play, just in different formats. But those original, those original topics all still matter. We also make a couple points about some things that, that have happened over the years of the CRA. First of all, the point that's been made many times is that this is the biggest CRA. You can put all the other CRAs in this area and you still have room to spare. Um, and, and the other point being that this CRA was particularly hard hit during the recession. And there's some lost time. It's not just lost money, it's lost time and lost sense of momentum and lost community cohesion. And so you can do what you want with this information at a later date, but we're sort of laying a basis here for the, po for the possible consideration um, in 2034 when this CRA sunsets 
that you may want to extend the CRA um, under some negotiated terms, and that, that's not going to be discussed today. But we're kind of trying to lay the predicate for that. This is a big, complicated area, and it's, it's been through some tough times. Um, however, despite that, we also have documented an enormous number of accomplishments. It's just hard to see them all, because as you said earlier, you know, you can do something over here and you don't notice it over here, right? So we, there, are, there has been a lot accomplished by the community, but we need to up our game and continue to advance. And we now are really going to have the resources to do that. That's really the point of that, of that section, um, talking about the background and history. The, the public input is simply to say that there was a very diverse, multi-dimensional um, approach to public input. We had to do a lot of things kind of out of the box and on the fly, responding to the COVID situation, um, and we did those things. And every single word that was written down um, on one of our surveys that were handed out online or in person was tabulated, organized, and brought into the language that's used in the themes. So the things that are in the themes are either they're either direct direct quotes or they're direct paraphrases of combinations of things that people told us. Um, all of the ideas essentially came from the community in one manner or another, either on the walks, in meetings, or through the surveys. So lots of points of input on this project, I think, is, is the point. So we want to have that in the report kind of for the record. Um, the other point that I think is important for this body and, and other bodies um, within the city is um, simply to say that, you know, all this community input came in and we started to formulate these themes around that input. And as we started to look at what, you know, and we interviewed each of you, minus one, we interviewed each of you in the uh, last a year ago summer to sort of talk about your thoughts about the area. Um, and what came out of that, I think, is really alignment between what the community is saying, what you all are interested in, and frankly, what a lot of aspects of the mayor's T3 program are. And so I felt like it was worth it to take, you know, take a moment in the report and make that comment because I don't believe that's been the case in the past. And it is the case today. I think we have real opportunity today that wasn't there um, in past years, past administrations, whatever, you know, however you want to contextualize that. You're talking about the same types of issues. You're using maybe some different words, but the time is now. The time to align Tampa moves to what the key streets are in East Tampa and partner money you know, and, and, you know, and, and work together. The, this, you're, the, the, the dominoes are set up for that to happen. Um, so talking about the themes, I mentioned the 10 themes before. We, we presented them initially in April um, of 2021, um, refined a little bit with the community. We brought them back in September with some pretty substantial work on what those themes mean in terms of actions, as well as some illustrations of what it might look like if you were to put those actions into motion. And you've seen the illustrations in the, in the report. And then we've been refining and writing the report and dealing with budget and stuff ever since. So here's the key point here. As, as you go through this section, we, we actually paired up the input and photographs of the input that we took in the field with the community, we paired them up one for one with what sort of the initial actions are. So there's sort of a, there's sort of a set of issues and there's sort of a response and they're paired up in that way intentionally so that you can look at the images on the, on, the, on the input thematic side and some of those captions, and then you can look at the very next page and say, you know, we have this, but we, we need to, we want more of this, or we want to start thinking about this, or we want things to move in this direction. So that's the way all 10 themes are set up and described. And then they're transposed. I'm just showing theme one, which was really one of the big drivers, obviously, housing. But then for each of the themes, they're, they are all identified in terms of projects, programs, um, uh, uh, and partnerships um, within the budget. So each theme is identified, or each, each action is identified within the budget, and then there's a run out of money over time that you can allocate and be flexible over time in terms of how you apply those dollars. Then what we felt like was, um, in chapter four, was we felt like, you know, there's, I've, I've worked on, dozens of CRA plans for all different size situations, different locations, and everything. And what we really felt like in this case 
was we really needed to literally articulate what some of the possibilities are so that people can better understand what the words mean because a picture is worth a thousand words, but also to really sh maybe show East Tampa in a new light, in a way that maybe people haven't considered it before, that there are special types of opportunities that really are available here, and it's time to look at it through these, these lights. So we started small. You know, East Tampa was a place that had um, an inordinate number of stormwater ponds, and there's really kind of an, an, an environmental equity question here. I mean, you wouldn't just go into Hyde Park and say we have a drainage problem, let's go buy a block, tear down the houses and put a stormwater pond in, right? That's, that's environmental equity. Um, now, those are decisions from decades ago. There's nobody in this room that's responsible for that. But that happened, and it happened in East Tampa. And it's time now to, well, well what do we do about it? Well, this is a call to action to say, you know, we know that we want better parks and recreation. That's a theme. We know that we want better local walkability and mobility. That's a theme. We know that we want um, our stormwater and our physical environment to, to look better. That's a theme, appearance, right? But what if we could put those together? There are locations where we can come in and intervene with very, a very light touch on these ponds and come in and provide a neighborhood park that's operating on multiple levels, multiple dimensions. And so I don't want to, I'm gonna, again, I'm not going to, I don't want to take all of your time. This, you, you had a big morning. But I really would encourage you, there's, there's an enormous amount of thought that's been put into the words that were selected for the themes and the actions and the imagery that is in these drawings, which I personally drew these drawings myself, and, every, and the labels that are on these drawings are referring to specific ideas. And what, what we really did with these was we tried to take, you know, you can't do a drawing of every street corner in a 4,500 acre area, right? But what we tried to do was we tried to identify some archetypal situational things that are common in East Tampa and deal with them and deal with them in a way that people could understand so that, so that the stormwater department, the mobility department, the East Tampa residents, the, the future leaders can sort of understand the spirit of what we're talking about here. 22nd Street was mentioned earlier as an important Main Street. Um, we wanted to be very careful about what we showed on the renewal of 22nd Street. We didn't necessarily want to pick a privately owned building and say, well, this building should be acquired and taken away and something should go back. Um, but we know, where those, we know where those properties are. And the CRA knows you know, where, where the target properties might be and where some deals might be had. We took a building that we owned, which was the building known as the Gator Building, and we showed a repurposing of that building for retail startup, um, community use, community benefit, new streetscape and an enlivening of that street is a way to gesturally say we need to pay we need to pay attention to the historic main street on 22nd um, we looked at the at the barrio area and this is you know this is obviously 15th and columbus and there's there's a whole set of ideas here that have to do someone mentioned earlier a grocery store i think it was councilman goods and i want to tell you when i found out that those properties on 26th where 22nd and 21st split, and that, that triangle piece, that was like a knife through the heart. Because I, I wanted to draw that drawing so bad for a small grocer to go in on that property. But that train had sailed. You know, it was already out, it was gonna be, it was gonna be single family. So I said, well, where's another spot that's like an important kind of main and main location where you might be able to recruit a small grocer? And I think there's one, and this is kind of an out of the box idea, but I think there's one at the corner of Columbus and 15th. Now, right now, you've got that triangle flat iron site. I understand that. And we went ahead and drew some plans for how this entire area could be improved. But there's, some, there's a couple of these plans where we did some set-aside drawings. And what you see on the right is kind of a bold idea. If Columbus was two-wayed, and there is a serious conversation about two-waying those one-way pairs, they're just, they just don't need to be one way, and tra your transportation department acknowledges that. If Columbus was two-wayed, there's really no reason to have that, that, that property coming through on that triangle. And if you could put all that together, I took an absolute, you know, the 1A standard, you know, 15,000 square foot grocery store that, you know, 
eight different grocery store companies put on the ground because I know what they are. And I put it on that site and said, you know, we, you could do something like that in the future. The possibility for that is there if you want to get something like that in a prominent location that would be, from a, from a grocer's perspective, would be meaningful to regional traffic, connected to Ebor, connected to East Tampa, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to talk about those. And again, it, it killed me when I heard that that property, you know, was going to be, I, I saw that property right away, uh, Mr. Goods. Um, we want to talk about the corridors, and you know, here's this is an important note. Um, again, connecting issues that are abstract with issues that are physical. You know, a lot of conversation about the need to quote clean up and improve Burrell Park, okay? And we know that that's on the park systems um, plan to do that work, but we also know that there are some inherent problems on Nebraska that are driving the challenges in Burrell Park. And this was probably the one instance where we did actually pick a specific private property and say, these are the kinds of properties that you need to go after, whether it's penny saver or whatever it is. We, you know, when, when we walked the neighborhood, what was profound to me, the neighbors all know where the, the, the neighbors all know where the problem sites are, right? And it's time to start intervening. And I frankly think whether you want to wait for the market to do it, because the market will do it, or if you want to get more proactive. But I think that that hotel property that's, that's you know, advertising essentially you know, hourly rates, you know, that should be acquired. And the opportunity for townhomes, someone mentioned earlier, you know, where can you assemble properties and put together maybe larger pieces of property to have smaller lots to get things in at a different price point, a different housing choice. We're trying to show that in this drawing. The corridors are the places to do that, not the heart of the single family neighborhoods. Um, and then of course, you know, humanizing and even showing the banners and so forth and turning Nebraska into an address. So these are very multi-dimensional drawings that really are talking about a lot of things at the same time, but they're all things that are firmly embedded in the 10, in the 10 community themes. Um, uh, again, um, Columbus Drive. Um, this is a very, very diverse area. It's got a lot of different land use types. I think the Columbus Drive area was just sort of seen as the back. And it wasn't really a focus, frankly, for the community. And we wanted to say, wait, 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 wait. We're all talking about jobs. We're all talking about employment. We're talking about, you know, commercial development that can create TIF TIF dollars and new opportunities that can that can generate revenue back into the neighborhoods. This this commercial this, 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 this manufacturing and, and, and industrial area along Columbus Drive is an unbelievable resource to the CRA, both financially as well as jobs and education and workforce training. And we need to capitalize on that. And there are now wheels in motion to start to explore that, as some of you may know. We also wanted to talk about, you know, we've got these other kind of large corridors like Hillsboro. Um, you know, there is a time and a place for um, what I would call sort of more contemporary suburban retrofit development, mid-rise development with different types of commercial. Um, what you can see here is this is the flea market site in the lower right, and then you can see, um, uh, you can see the, the, um, the educational facility is immediately um, next to it in the old Sears building. And what we said is, okay, look, the place for, the place for mid-rise development is not in the heart of the neighborhoods. But these corridors, you know, that are just commercial corridors, they are underperforming. And it is a slam dunk to come in on these properties and do a different type of development that there is an audience for and put these properties into motion. And the fact that you now have the, the, the city's um, employment center going to be right near here, you know, even doubles down on that premise. And so we did a drawing that said, well, maybe over time, you know, we need to think about these corridors in different ways. And so we drew something here that was urban, it's walkable, it has blocks that are interconnected with sidewalks. Um, it does put retail up on Hillsboro, but starts to treat Hillsboro as a parkway road with trees and proper, um, proper transit 
um, opportunities and so forth. But then, but then it starts to break down as it goes back to the neighborhood into sort of a townhome kind of a concept that can start to relate to the existing single family behind. And then to the left, you see eventually, I mean, eventually that's, that, that, that Sears building is going to become obsolete. One could argue it's obsolete now. There is an opportunity for a new tech campus that continues the tradition of, of um, multi-institutional training and education in that space. There could also be other officing, um, maybe business incubator sites there, maybe even a business class hotel could go into that site. So enormous opportunities. We're trying to help people sort of see, you know, we, we wanted to tackle what's in your front yard, which is that ugly stormwater pond. But we also, you know, this is a big area and we want to understand the value and the importance of these large corridors too. It's all part of the same picture of East Tampa. And then finally, we ended on this, this um, kind of more dramatic sketch of, of the, the pond on 20, 26th. There is opportunity, and you mentioned again, putting properties together. You know, we are showing in this drawing, you know, opportunities to come in and do incremental improvements to existing homes. And on vacant lots, we're showing townhomes and, and incremental development. You talk about other builders that would want to come in and do this. We're showing incremental development. We're even encroaching into the pond a little bit. We did some engineering analysis with our subconsultant. We think we can encroach a little bit into that pond and buy some, buy some land back and get some eyes on that pond in the form of front door townhomes. Um, and then turn the pond into, a, into, a, into an environmental amenity, an educational amenity, a community gardening amenity, and ultimately something that provides value for the neighborhoods around to continue to um, improve and enhance quality of life. So then I get to technical inventory, and I don't want to bore you with this, but this, ironically, this is the map, and everything in purple is um, uh, vacant and publicly owned. Um, uh, we did some maps, and again, this, is a whole, this would be a whole other discussion, but there's a whole series of maps in the middle of the drawings. You know, we, we, did, we, did, the, we did the 40, 40 or 45 sort of inventory things that are in GIS, but the question is, how do you communicate that in a way that makes any sense? And so we, we did some diagrams in there that talk incrementally about the different layers of community and why Nebraska is different from Hillsboro, is different from um, the Columbus Drive corridor. Um, and, and the differences between those arterials, they're, 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 they're three arterials, but they're actually very different. You know, 40th, Hillsboro, and Nebraska are very different. And that those are actually different from the historic main streets, which you see in the lighter pink running north-south through the middle of East Tampa. You know, these roads like 34th and 15th and 22nd and so forth and so on. That's the place to reinvest in this incremental sort of locally owned business, maybe a little bit of mixed use if you can get some live over work. You know, that's the place to think about those things. And the planning department right now is completing a new look at the zoning uh, regulations to better enable this type of development on 15th as, an, as a case study. Um, that could be applied to other areas. Also in the technical section is, you know, the whole, the whole TIF generation thing. We try to be pretty conservative with the TIF generation. Um, you know, we, we, everything that we did in our budgeting was based on the low projection, and we set a common low projection, recognizing we drew numbers from a year ago when we did this. We set the low projection for this year, where, where you've got well over $8 million. We set it at 7.8 across the board. And then we started, and then we, and then we started doing our projections from there. I think reality for you is is conservatively somewhere between low and medium, and the potential is somewhere between medium and high, if you look at the coming years. However, for the purposes of budgeting for the document, we completely stuck to the low projection. That's, I mean, and we really feel comfortable that that is, again, unless there's a major disruption in the world, you know, in the way that there was in 2009, we feel very solid about those low projections as being the floor. So to summarize, you know, we've got these six, th we're, I'm sorry, part six, we've, we've got these um, 10 themes. We broke down sort of what some of the initial first steps are, um, uh, along with sort of the philosophical mission statement. They are baked into the budgeting spreadsheet, and I think this becomes a tool again, for the community to think about what East Tampa is in a new way 
and be able to more um, thoughtfully and in a more in a more holistic way think about opportunities in East Tampa that can really elevate opportunities for everyone. And that's that's what this plan is about. Thank you. Anyone? Um, board member uh, Miranda. Thank you very much. I, uh, I was very interested in your presentation. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that community can come back where it was once. And when you talked about 15th and uh, 21st Street, uh, 21st Avenue, I should say, at that corner there used to be a grocery store called El Recurso. Right. On the other side of the street, there was a service station there for many years mm -hmm. called Cascading yep. Park Service. Yep. On the other side, you got the park called Cascading. I think it's the only park in America that's got two Hall of Fame baseball players who have the Hall of Fame become from one park, which right. is a rarity. And uh, Cascading <laughs> Park Pool, we spent a lot of money in past and present to make it yeah. what it is today. Yeah. So there's some spark there. Or it needs a little energy to, to catch on and be a yeah. fantastic area. All those homes opposite a recurso across from the 15th Street, there was a sort of a semi house where you could go in and buy a beer, but you could also buy groceries at the same time. Right. It was a walkable community. You could walk all over the place. And on 15th um, and 26th Avenue, there was a, uh, a little call, a little place called, before that was, of all things, sold feed stores, sold feeds for hogs <laughs> and cattle and everything else. And then it became ideal sundries. Yeah. And uh, I can tell you the whole neighborhood by name, by person, where they lived, because I was born there. And uh, I'm not trying to brag, I was just mm -hmm. lucky. So those are the things that, uh, that happened there, and I understand the rest of the park, and what you said is true. You could turn something that's not so good today with the new technology to something that is beautiful. And yeah. I commend you for it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Um, board Member Goods. Mr. Uh, Drumgo. Uh, Mr. Drumgo. Uh, 14 and 15, uh, are we talking about the dollar amount to pay us today? Uh, so there, 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 are, two, there are two items. The first is the acceptance of the SAP itself, and which was uh, voted 6 to 2 by the CAC. The second item is the additional services, approximately $60,000 uh, that were added on for some additional community meetings. So it's an additional scope. Um, and so we, I believe that um, in previous discussions, the, the goal was to get through the plan itself, have the plan adopted and accepted, and then agree to that additional scope of services as a closeout. And so that is item number 15. So there are two separate items, but they're both related to your strategic action plan. But you're getting ready to do a redevelopment plan again, correct? That is accurate, Council. <coughs> I just have a few things, and, and we can get out of here. Um, you have a redevelopment plan come up, so that's going to... That's going to supersede this, this SAP, correct? Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll say yes, but you're, to some degree, and uh, you know there may be some slight amendments to the uh, to the SAP as well, based upon the CAC's desire, and it sounded like this this body's desire to see that redevelopment plan be updated. Yeah, the, the concept is the strategic action plan is supposed to be a more specific way to implement the community redevelopment plan, which is supposed to be a more broad based plan where you have broader concepts and things, much more, much like the, uh, uh, like the comp plan. It's, this is more like the zoning to implement the comp plan in some ways. I, I'm going to support both items today uh, hesitantly. Uh, when I look at the plan, uh, I was looking for actual items. I was looking for a little bit more of what the contract asked for, and I didn't see a lot. Some things were missing. I know there's a lot of controversy about this $60,000, but we, we've got to move on. I can't let this hold us back from moving on. So I'm going to go and support to go ahead and pay GI to get them out of the way, get them down the road so we can move forward, so we can do the things we need to do to get, get these actual things moving. Uh, uh, the community has spoken. They've contacted me about this thing a long, long time. I'm just ready to kick it down the road, let GI move down the road, and we move so we can get down to, to some real work. Uh, so that's why I stand on it. Board Member Carlson. Yeah, just quickly, um, th th there's a lot of great detail in here, and um, we need to make sure that the community hears about it. I, I presume that the $60,000 we are paying for is stuff work that's already been done? That's accurate. Okay. Um, whether it's this consultant or, or staff, ideally staff, 
Um, I think we ought to, uh, maybe as a segue to the next planning process, mm -hmm. is have a, a big community town hall to, to talk about this and, and have the, and it would be led by the CRA board and probably the CRA chair, you know, with, with Councilmember Good's help. But um, it needs to be a well advertised uh, and promoted event. And, and ideally, what it would do is at the end of it, we would ask for uh, community assistance where people could uh, volunteer to help with uh, certain parts of it and, and whatever nonprofits or other community groups that are out there already could um, you know, ca could have a list to get or, or tables to get people to sign up to support um, but you know we had that housing fair a couple years ago and hardly anybody showed up it needs to be well advertised um, and, and not in the conventional ways if, if we're going to do something like this but the community wants us to try to bring everybody together and rally a lot of great work's been done we need to let the public know about it and get people to rally around it and also understand what they can do to support this Thank you. To approve number 14. Um, we have a, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hungry. A motion by board member Maniscalco and a second by uh, board member Miranda. Roll call. Carlson. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Citro. Yes. Miranda. Yes. Goods. Yes. And her attack. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. I think there needs to be a motion to uh, uh, mm -hmm. number 15. Second. Okay, we have a motion by board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Goods. Roll call. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Citro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Hertzak? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. So, roll to the item. I think we've done 14, 15 now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Roll to item number 16. Um, this is the community development plan rewrite for the channel district. Uh, you all, uh, this has been presented to you already. It came to you several months ago for processing. It's been to the planning commission. They found it consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, which is a requirement under chapter 163. It's coming back to you in your capacity as city council next Thursday to actually approve it because only city council can approve an amendment or change to the community redevelopment plan but under state law you and your capacity as the CRA must recommend its approval to you to yourself as city council move the resolution okay resolution uh, moved by uh, board member Citro seconded by board member Maniscalco roll call Maniscalco yes. Carlson yes Citro yes Vieira yes. Miranda yes. Goods yes. and her attack yes motion carry unanimously and then item number 17 is a consent and release agreement that the Columbia operating company has uh, executed in favor of the city to allow us to move forward with the uh, street lighting and archway project in Okay, motion made by uh, board member Miranda, seconded by board member Citro. Roll call. Carlson. Yes. Boots. Yes. Maniscalco. Yes. Vieira. Yes. Citro. Yes. Miranda. Yes. And her attack. Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Okay. Um, any information? Does anyone have reports? Yes. Council Member Carlson. I'm sorry, Board Member Carlson. <laughs> Just quickly, sorry everybody. Um, another story came out about the Jackson House today and we've, mm -hmm. this board has supported the Jackson House over the years and we all know the issues and we're all frustrated by it. I think I would like to make three quick motions. Uh, number one, that, uh, that the CRA Board re ask staff to um, uh, ask the adjacent property owners for a proposal to buy um, sufficient space adjacent to the Jackson House to allow for renovation and then report back at the next meeting. I'll hesitantly second that, but I wish this wasn't necessary and people could just accommodate considering the significance of the Jackson House and the exorbitant cost to, to restore this. Okay, motion made by board member um, Carlson, seconded by board member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Do we have a date on that that you wanted that the, back? The next, whatever. The okay. Next September meeting. Second, second, and, and you know, with sitting with the city, and Morris won't let me talk about this, but the, the other, the the hammer option is is eminent domain, but we can't talk about that now. Correct. Uh, that's why I think it would be better to, to offer in advance. Um, in connection with that, um, I, would I would like to make a second motion that the CRA board request that staff um, 
asked the uh, Jackson House Foundation about the possibility of buying the Jackson House and the land, um, and then report back to us next month about the Certainly. feasibility of that. So and and the, re the reason would be that, um, as I understand the law, it would be easier for us to work on other solutions if we controlled the land. And I, um, I can talk about it more if you want. Okay. Um, motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, the, the third one would be to ask the, uh, for the CRA board to ask staff to, uh, and by the way, the last one was reported back in September also. Mm -hmm. the, the, this one would be, um, the CRA board would ask um, uh, the CRA staff to ask um, USF, uh, the History Center, and the Jackson House Foundation uh, to, to talk to us about um, what it would take uh, to rebuild the Jackson House in the case that it falls down and then report back in September. You all may know Manhattan Casino, uh, similar important uh, African-American building in St. Petersburg. It was not salvageable, so they rebuilt the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, and, it, and if it, um, you all know I believe that the, the location of this is important because it not only tells the story of people that were there, but it tells the story of segregation in Tampa, and I think it's important that it stay there. So we, the, the motion would be that we would ask staff to come back um, uh, to report on what it would take to start planning um, rebuilding it in the event that it uh, falls down. Okay, motion made by Board Member Carlson, seconded by Board Member Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The one thing I would like, I, I, these motions are fine, but most of them will have to be accomplished by city staff and not CRA staff. I mean, city staff will be the one that would have to approach about the possibility, what the real estate possibilities are really. Our real, through our real estate staff. So I just want to make you all aware that when the report comes back through Mr. Dumdo or, uh, or Ms. Travis, it's going to be folks, the city departments that are going to be happy to provide that information to them. And so I, and I, we'll, we'll just see where we are in September. So. Okay. And I have no. Board member? No. Happy birthday to uh, board member Goose. His birthday was on the 10th. Happy birthday. <laughs> I don't think you want us to sing, but we can. Oh, okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Anything? I just want to say that, that um, I don't know what's taking so long in reference to the the logo for the East Tampa or or the, or the CRA, but I mean, for me, it shouldn't take that long for a logo to be to be done for a logo. The last one I saw, I I, I admit it was horrible. Yeah. Uh, it was horrible. <laughs> uh, but I don't, I don't know what's taking so long, and also the signage. If we're gonna do projects. Especially with the house thing we've been doing, I think the sign needs to be a little bit bigger because it's like a small little yard, so nobody can't really see that and understand what it is. So if we're going to do a project by each yard, we need to have a sign that people can see and see what's going on. If, if I may come. Absolutely. If I may. Uh, just on the marketing piece and the logo, uh, it does take a little bit of work. So, you know, there's procurement, and we do have to go through that process of uh, putting together a package to procure those services. So initially, I can tell you that um, when I sent out communication to each of you separately on the previously proposed logo that had been worked on, you know, ahead of my arrival here, um, the feedback was not great. And so I um, wanted to go through the cycle of talking about branding and what that means for you as a board. Uh, so it, it will take a little bit longer. Now, I will tell you that from the marketing perspective, we want to get the information out there. So I do. I, I, I really need some approval on a temporary logo, a, t a placeholder that'll just allow us to get in these social media spaces so that we can go out and, and put the word out there while we work on the process of going through branding and having those individual meetings with each of you. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it's more than just- But uh, Mr. Drew, I, Mr. Drew, how about I, this? I, I, what, I, what I don't understand <laughs> is, you, uh, a city aside, we don't sure. have a, 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 a uh, design pro, uh, uh, area in, in the city of somebody who does it. We gotta, we gotta go outside and pay to have a logo done? I have a scope of services in my inbox now. We could, we could, we could do an exercise with you to figure out what you like. But again, process-wise, I just think that um, it's beneficial to have some professionals who are, you know, that we have do it. Um, if, if, you, if you'd like to, Miss Parks has been great about jumping in on the CRA work and, and working on the marketing and branding. And we can certainly just set up individual meetings to take feedback from each of you and design something based upon that feedback. But again, I would love to have the marketing professionals do that with you. Board Member Carlson. Yeah. 
this is something I do in my day job, and there's a long process and a short process, but one thing that would help is that it is if each of each of us would send somebody one sentence description of what you think the CRA is, and then five word five words that are attributes you think describe it. Um, the problem with what they sent is that there's no objective criteria to decide whether it's good or not. We, I think several of us had the same reaction, but we it, it, uh, something that ultimately is subjective has to be described by uh, by objective ways. If you if you, if the brief is that. Uh, if you're buying clothes in the brief is that someone needs business attire so they can go to a meeting full of lawyers, we all would have expectation about what that is. But if the brief is just, please buy clothes, somebody could show up with a bathing suit on. So we, we need to have some criteria to, to understand what it, what it should be. Would you like to make a motion to do that? I, I, th okay. I, th I talked to somebody about it, and I think that's part of the process they're looking at. Sure, and okay. it's probably Belix uh, because I've given her some direction to go out and talk to uh, some of your your aides and schedule time to have some of those discussions so I mean again we can do a temporary placehold while we work through that process but the inspiration would be great and help move us towards uh, a logo sooner anything else it's a big decision yes just one earlier I talked about landscaping and I'll have Mary I'll give you the uh, clerk's office in, in, in proper form but regarding landscaping give to the CR board the CRA board what type of landscaping we can use on those areas that we're going to do and that that be Florida friendly that the Florida friendly would be amenable to the eyesight and most importantly that it be a low cost maintenance mm -hmm. that's it and I'll give Second. I'll give that okay. to the so we have a, a motion made by board member Miranda and seconded by board member Carlson all in favor Aye. Okay. Sorry. Second. okay Motion made by uh, board member Maniscalco, seconded by board member Citro. See you tonight.